Welcome to the EWTM Accounting Excel Seminar in Seattle. Now, this video here is going to be an epic video. This is for a conference in Se Seattle. It's going to be like between an hour and two hours long. Here are the uh, topics over on this sheet. We'll look at the subtopics. A couple things before we start this video. One is, if you want to download this workbook and follow along and practice with the video, click on the link below the videos. Not only that, but because it's such a long video, here's the nine main topics over on the subtopic sheet. Here are the subtopics. You want to click the Show More button below, because there will be hyperlinks to the different parts of the video. You click on the Time hyperlink, and it will jump. So if you want to talk about percentage number format, Show More, click on the Time link. Now there's going to be a, this is a huge video. We're going to cover keyboards, number formatting, efficient formula creation. Look at all those topics. These topics will be below in the Show More. Look up formulas, a huge section on pivot tables, uh, two recorded macros, and a bunch of things on charts. All right, so you can download the file. You can click the Show More and go to that hyperlink, and we're using Excel 2010. So we're going to start with our first topic, keyboards. I'm going to click on the sheet called Keyboards. Now, of course, if you don't know how to be efficient with formulas, you don't know how to create pivot tables and other Excel features, then you know you're you're going to have a hard time working and using Excel. Ah, but what's the most important thing to becoming efficient after you have some basic foundation knowledge? Keyboard shortcuts. Now, let's look at a few here. I'm just going to show you a few throughout the videos. I'll be using keyboards. What you want to do is you want to take the time and teach yourself keyboards because, man, they're fast. Let's look at our first keyboard. If I'm just looking at this data set and I don't know how many records are there, there are, well, I could, jump, I could scroll down and look for the bottom, right? But no, you don't want to scroll down. Let's do Control Arrow. Control Arrow jumps to the bottom of the current region. It keeps going until it sees a blank cell and stops. If you control arrow now and there's nothing, it'll go to the bottom. Another really helpful keyboard shortcut is Control Home. You're working in the spreadsheet. You're a couple hundred rows down, and you're like, I just want to get to the top. Control Home always goes to A1. Now, another useful keyboard is let's say we want to highlight all of this range here. If I have one side of the range selected, before I click on this next range, if I hold the Shift key, boom, it highlights everything between. Touch the first part, before touching the last part, hold Shift, and boom, you've highlighted the whole thing. And then you could do something like add a number formatting. I could go up to the Home and then apply either accounting or currency. Now wait a second. I just have my ribbons collapse because it gives me more room. How did I do that? You could right click unminimize in 2010, or there's a keyboard. Control F1 is a toggle. Control F1 toggles on and off the um, ribbon tabs. Now we could get the currency there. Not only that, we could use the keyboard, and it's right here, Control-1. Control-1, that opens the Format Cells dialog box. Because so much of what you do in the spreadsheet is cells, this is a powerful dialog box. And we'll look at a bunch of options throughout the videos. This is number formatting. So I'm going to click on Currency or Accounting. Now the nice thing about using this dialog box is then you have control. You could say, I don't want to see decimals. I'm going to click Escape so it doesn't apply. Can you believe it? There's a keyboard shortcut for currency. And I use this all the time because I have huge data sets and I need a quick currency format. Control Shift 4. Absolutely amazing. Now let's talk about not click, shift, click, but something much more useful. What if I wanted to highlight this whole column and add a number format? This is huge, right? I could do this manually, but not this one. Well, guess what? We can combine Control Down Arrow, Control Home, with the Shift trick. So watch this. Control Down Arrow would jump to the bottom, but if I hold Shift, boom, instantly the whole column is highlighted. Control Shift 4 to add currency. Unfortunately, there isn't an accounting um, 
a, a keyboard for the accounting number format. Now I'm going to control F1. Currency and accounting, what is the difference? Currency has this floating dollar sign. Accounting has the uh, dollar sign fixed on the outside. People like accounting uh, number format because it lines up the decimals. But a lot of time, these uh, dollar signs here, uh, you don't want them. Whoa, check this out. This is 2007, 10, and 13. Accounting uh, number format is right there. It's not currency. That's accounting. And look at this. In earlier versions, this has always been here. But it was called the comma style. But guess what? It's really, if you read this screen tip right here, it's really accounting without the dollar sign. People like that comma because it lines everything up. No dollar sign. Now, notice that we have some decimals showing here. There's no problem. We can come up and use our Decrease Decimal button here. But I want to show you the QUAT. This is the Quick Access Toolbar. And if you look at your uh, computers, probably doesn't look the same as mine because I've altered mine. You can simply right click Customize Quick Access Toolbar. And the trick is, once you get to this Options, this is the, the Options area. It's automatically on Quick Access. You come up to Choose Commands From, and you want to say All. I wish that was the default instead of popular, right? So all. Then there's all like 1,000 plus things you can do in Excel. Now, you can add any button. You can go through this list and say Add. Originally, I had Undo, Redo, Save. There's keyboards for those, so I got rid of them by saying Remove. Notice I've added a few here. I'm going to click OK. What's so cool about that is watch this. we got to talk about the Alt keyboard shortcuts. Now, in earlier versions, when you hit the Alt key, it underlined menus. But since 2007, they show you these screen tips. Now, we'll show you, especially when we do pivot tables, is a great keyboard shortcut that we derive from using the Alt keys. But notice, up here on the Quack, whatever buttons you put, first, second, third, and whatever order you put, there's a 1. So I've hit Alt. If I tap 1 now, it will apply this. I'm going to click Escape. So really, after you get the hang, you teach yourself your Alt keyboard shortcuts for here. I'm going to Alt 1, Alt 1, just like that. It decreases the decimal. Now, that's your sort of personal Alt keyboards, because each computer can have a different order to the um, quat buttons here, 1, 2, 3. Now, the Alt keys for a pivot table will be the same on each sheet. So here, just to show you how awesome these Alt keyboards are, here's a data set. Field names at the top, records in rows. Let's hit the Alt key. Which one of these would we use to get to? Data, well, you'd think that the pivot table would be there, oh, but it's not. They put it on Insert. you got to tap N. And look at that. It opens up that ribbon tab. So to get to uh, pivot tables, you hit V. And then to table, you hit T. And then it would ask you. So if you do pivot tables all the time, you teach you yourself that Alt keyboard. The reason they designed Alt to show up with little screen tips this is so that each person in their daily activities, if they're always doing area charts, they'll teach themselves the keyboard for that. If you're always doing pivot tables, you'll learn Alt and VT. All right. Now, we want to talk about the sum function. The sum function is one of over 400 functions, and it's the only one with a keyboard shortcut. Hey, why? Because it's used so often. Now, let's go to the Home ribbon and just take, take a second. since. Everybody, if you want to be efficient, if you use Excel, you should know this keyboard. But if you don't remember it, no problem. A lot of the elements in the ribbon, like hover over B, it says Control B. Hey, that's one of the oldest keyboard shortcuts ever. But hover over the auto sum. So if you forget, the keyboard is what? Alt plus equals. You ready? Alt equals. Now, the dancing ants are dancing around. They're dancing so that if it didn't guess right, it's as if Excel is being polite. It's saying, hey, I know I might not have guessed the right range. You can redirect it either with your mouse or with your arrow keys. As long as the dancing ants are still dancing, you can still redirect. So I'm going to click right there and watch this. We're going to use Control Shift Down Arrow not for formatting the cells, but to Control Shift Down Arrow, Insert a range into a formula. Look at that, B2 to B1001. Now if I hit Enter, it goes down one cell. I'm going to show you an alternative here. Watch Alt equals. 
Now, I'm going to use my arrow key, left arrow, right arrow, and then that's just to get the cell started in B2, and then Control, Shift, down arrow. Instead of using Enter, I'm going to use Shift, Enter. Shift, Enter puts the thing in the cell and jumps the cursor up. Now let's try this down here. Alt equals, that puts the sum function in. Instead of hitting Enter and pushing my cursor down, because I immediately want to format the cell after I enter the formula, I'm going to use the keyboard Control Enter. Control Enter puts the thing in the cell, keeps the cell selected. Again, the idea is most people do Enter and then click back or arrow back, and that's an extra click that you don't need. Now we immediately want to add double line accounting. So I'm going to Control 1 to open Format Cells on the Font tab, I'm going to go to Underline. And there we have Single or Double Accounting Underline. And then I click OK. That's different than the border. Up here, this would put Double Line for the whole cell. This just does the number. All right, keyboards, absolutely fundamental to being efficient in Excel. Our next topic is number formatting. Let's go click on the number formatting sheet. Hey, wait a second. I bet you there's a keyboard shortcut to jump from this sheet to keyboards to number formatting. There is. If you're going to the right, control page down, jumps to the next sheet. Now watch this, control page down. I'm just page down. When it gets to some sheets that there are some sheets that are not showing, they're under the scroll bar, it will not only activate the next sheet, but it will expose sheets not visible. Absolutely amazing. Now to go to the left, control page up. It's a great keyboard shortcut, especially when you have a huge workbook filled with many sheets. Now, keyboards are really fundamental to becoming efficient. A topic that many people are not aware of is number formatting. Now, lots of people you know, on the planet Earth, everyone uses Excel and many different endeavors. And people know how to use formulas and pivot tables. But a lot of times, number formatting will trip them up. But here's the deal. There's only one concept you need to get, and then you understand number formatting. It's a facade. Number formatting, like accounting, currency, percentage, it's just something that sits on top. It's like painting the house or putting a Halloween mask on. The surface can be different than underneath. Now, let me delete these. If I come here and Alt equals, Tab, Tab. Notice I put something in the cell and I was immediately going to the right, so I use Tab, Alt equals. Now what's going on here? I can clearly add this in my head. These should equal 100, and these should equal 100. Well, what we see on the surface of the spreadsheets can sometimes be different than what's actually in the cell. I'm going to highlight these. And I'm going to notice that up here on the Quat, I have Increase as the second button, so I'm going to Alt-2-2. Two, two. And there we go. We can see that number formatting, something as simple as decreasing the decimal, was showing us something different on the surface of the spreadsheet. That number, 49.5, is what was sitting in the cell. Down here, too, Alt-2-2. Two, two. Now I'm going to actually highlight all this in Alt-1-1. One, one. Notice. I'm seeing a 50. That's the surface. That's the facade. You can look for some with some number formats. You can look up into the formula bar and see what's actually in the cell. Absolutely important if you're going to be able to track down errors and not get tricked by number formatting. And one of the most um, important types of number formatting to understand is date number formatting. Now let's learn an important keyboard shortcut. If you're hard coding dates into Excel, say you're doing transactions, instead of typing out today's date, how about the keyboard? Control semicolon. I absolutely love that. Now let's do that again. Control semicolon. I'm going to Control Enter. Now look there. That's what it looks like. I, I see on the surface of the spreadsheet an 8, a slash, a 26, 2013. And if you look up to the formula bar, hey, it looks like that's what's in the cell. But now, the trick is, is we can wipe away all number formatting, apply general, and you'll see what's in the cell. What? 41,519? You've got to be kidding me. 
what's, and I'm going to control Z because this is so important to know about general number formatting, especially if you're working with dates and times because number formatting gets applied when you don't like it. The keyboard shortcut is control shift uh, grave accents or tilde. So control shift uh, grave accents or tilde, and that applies the general formatting. Now that's pretty weird, but this is convenient when they first started making spreadsheets, they wanted people to be able to enter dates into the cell and do date math. So we could subtract two dates and figure out how late an invoice was. The first day in Excel history is 1-1-1900. Day 2 is 1-2-1900. 9-4 is 41,521. So that's the day that the seminar will be given. This is the day that I'm shooting the video. So that's convenient. But again, there's this disconnect. If you click here and look up here, they didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't put the actual number there, probably because most people would just say, what is that? But we know it's just counting. It's a serial number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to whatever day it is since December 31st, 1899. So since that date, 1, 1, 1900 is 1 uh, since this date here. 41,521. Now, the reason this is so important, important is because, of course, we can do date math. I put whatever date I'm going to do, control semicolon, and enter. The way you do date math to figure out the difference between two dates, I'm going to type an equal sign, and I'm going to use my arrow keys, because if the formula inputs, the cells with the things you want to calculate upon are close. It's more convenient and quicker to use your arrow key. So I'm going to do the minus sign and then up, up arrow. That'll give us the difference. And that's perfect for invoicing. That's the way invoicing or loans, uh, days that a loan is outstanding. However, if you have a project, you have to remember to subtract the later date minus the earlier date, and then add one back in. So anytime that the start date is included, you want to add one back in. Now, there is a keyboard shortcut for t the current time. It is Control-Shift, semicolon. And that will give you the current time. And actually, really cool, you can do Control, semicolon, space, Control-Shift. Uh, semicolon, and that'll give you the date and time. Now let's just look at these two things here. I'm going to wipe away the number formula and look at general, Control, Shift, Tilde, or Grave Accent. So if we had today's date, Control, Semicolon, Control, Enter, Control, Shift, Tilde, you see it's just an integer. Uh, time is always a number between 0 and 1, representing the proportion of one 24-hour day. And if you do them both, it combines them. Now, the reason that time is a serial number between 0 and 1, if only I could type. Uh, anyway, the reason that time is a number between 0 and 1 is because it represents a proportion of 1 24-hour day. So what they do is they say 8 divided by 24 equals 1 third, um, or 0.333333 out to 15 threes. Or if it's noon, that number will be 0.5. So if I were to type in the cell 8 colon, zero, zero, space, AM, tab. Notice it puts, um, it shows that. There's the time up there. Over here, if I type noon, 12, colon, zero, zero, PM. If I wipe away the formatting, control, shift, tilde, I get those numbers. Time, again, the idea is equals 8 divided by 24 equals 12 divided by 24, the proportion of one 24-hour day. Now let's scroll down and look at some time examples. Here's some times typed into the column. If you click on the uh, cell there and look up in the formula bar, you can see, oh yeah, look, they're both showing that number formatting. But we know that this decimal that represents a 20 proportion of one 24-hour day, that's actually what's in the cell. Now this is important because if we want to start doing formulas like time math, figure out time build as an integer and decimal, if we take our formula equals later time minus earlier time, control enter, it's going to calculate upon the decimals. Further, because we're using formula inputs here that have a number formatting, that number formatting got sucked 
right here. So it looks like it's an acceptable three and a half hours. It looks like I could type a wage like 25, and then come down here and say equals that 25 times the three and a half. But what do I get? Well, again, I'm sucking <coughs> that number formatting. Remember, this keyboard shortcut, Control-Shift-Tilde, is invaluable if you're doing date and time number formatting. Well, that's ridiculous. What's happening is 25 times Control-Shift-Tilde, 0.14, that's giving this answer. We, this person, if they work three and a half hours, is going to get a lot more than $3.64. No problem. It's a decimal, and Excel thinks that um, a decimal is a proportion of 124 hour a day. So I'm going to hit F2 and edit this. We simply force the subtraction to calculate first and multiply times 24. Now, we'll talk about it in our next topic. These are formula inputs, all of them. That's an operator. These are parentheses to fourth the subtraction before the multiplication. But notice, these are numbers that have the potential to change. So we put them in the cells, label them, and use cell references to refer to those formula inputs. This, however, is not going to change. This is a formula input that you can just flat out type into your formula. All right, we'll come back, because that's one of the most important topics in Excel also. We'll talk more about when you can type numbers into formulas and when you can't. All right, now let's. Um, we looked at time there. We can see now that the gross is totally correct, 87.5. One last number formatting. And this, as accountants, everyone uses percentages. So the number of all the years I've been teaching and doing conferences and consulting with Excel, the number one mistake that I've seen has to do with percentage number formatting. And here it is. Someone wants. 3%, so they type a 3 into the cell. And then they either Control-1, Percentage, go up to here, Percentage, however you do it, and they get 300%. The problem is Excel obeys you perfectly. We put the number 3 in there. It slid the decimal and added a percentage symbol, all as a number formatting. That number 3 is still in the cell. Control Shift tilde shows us that that 3 is in the cell. So that's not how you do it. If you type the number in first, or there's decimals from some calculation, say 0 0.03, that will work. You can apply a number format to that. But don't forget, the 3, that's beautiful if you made 300% profit from this quarter to the next quarter, but it won't work for tax rates. Um, let's look at adding the percentage format before you put the number in the cell. Because here, if we put the number in the cell first, and then second apply the number formatting, we get problems. But watch this. And I don't know how they decided that it works this way. But I'm going to apply percentage format before I put anything in the cell. Then if I type a 3, and by the way, you can always tell it's pre-formatted because that percentage symbol pops up. That's not going to be a problem. But watch this, 0 0.03. The percentage symbol doesn't pop up, but it works. So those are two uh, important things if the cell is pre-formatted. Now, a lot of times with percentages, you know, you're just typing out. You can actually type uh, format as you type. So I'm going to type 3.00. Right now, if I hit Enter or Control Enter, the integer 3 goes into the cell. But if I type a percentage symbol, I'm saying, hey, I'm formatting as I type. So when I Control Enter, yes, we see the percentage number format. But the number that went into the cell is 0 0.03. Control Shift tilde will verify that. I'm going to Control Z. Wait a second. I don't have the undo and redo on my quat here. And the reason why is. Those are like our best friends. We use them 100 times every day. So Control-Z is undo. Control-Y is redo. I'm going to Control-Z and leave it there. Here's another big problem with uh, percentage number format. Someone has done some calculation. They get 0 0.025. That's going to be some, some rate. They come up and they use this percentage button. Oh, no, my 2.5% is converted to a 3. Again, it's just number formatting. If you're not aware that there's a uh, disconnect between what you see on the top 
and what's underneath, then you can get into trouble. Now, interestingly enough, this will show us 2.5 there. Up, So if you're looking up in the formula bar, you can see it's correct. But really, we should increase the decimal either with these buttons or with the quad. I'm going to Alt 2. By the way, Alt 1, you can prove that to yourself. That is not 3%. So equals 100 times. 3% will give us $3, but formulas don't see number formatting. Now we want to go to our next sheet. I'm going to use Control Page Down, and we want to talk about formulas. And then we're going to look at some lookup formulas on this sheet. Now, we already alluded to Excel's golden rule. And it is, if a formula input data of any sort can change, put it in a cell and refer to it with a cell reference. If it doesn't change, you can go ahead and hard code it into the formula. We saw an example earlier where we had times. Those could change. So we use cell references. And the 24 hours in our formula wasn't uh, a formula input that can change, so we typed it in. Now this goes back to Bricklin and Frankson's original spreadsheet. Their idea was they didn't want to have to re-enter a bunch of variables into a formula if only one of them changed. So they thought they created the first uh, spreadsheet, VisiCalc. That's Excel's golden rule. Now, in the book I wrote, Slaying Excel Dragons, I have a huge chapter on formula. And what I've done is I've kind of taken a, a bulleted list of all the ideas from there. So if you want to uh, read through this, you can. Here's all the type of things that can go into formulas. Those are formula elements. We have our math operators, our comparative operators, different types of formula. These are just the terms I've I use. We'll look at some examples of each one of these. Here is the order of precedence, or this is how Excel calculates a formula, which really comes in handy if you make uh, complicated formulas. It can help to shorten a lot of formulas. Or knowing this can help you track down errors. We have number formatting. We talked about that. Data alignment. Text is always to the left. Numbers are always to the right. That is an important default setting, which helps you track down errors like, are numbers really being considered text? Logical formulas, we'll see an example. The answer always gets spit out centered in the middle. That is a default setting in Excel. All right, let's look at some examples here. Uh, first example, just a simple example, we have annual insurance, and we want to calculate the monthly allocation. Well, I'm going to say equals formula input. That's, that's a number that can change, and I'm going to divide it by 12. That's a formula input that probably is not going to change. So it's all OK to hard code this in. Now, I call this a calculating formula. It just means that gives you some number answer. There is an equal sign cell reference math operator and a number that's not going to change. Now, let's look at violation of our golden rule. We want to calculate a tax, so we say, hey, take this amount times 0.125. Now, a bunch of you should be laughing, right? Because people all over the world since the beginning of spreadsheet time have been doing this. Why is it a bad idea? Because when you hit Enter, I don't see any indication of how I made that calculation. Even if you come back to it next week, you know, you're looking at the spreadsheet and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know where the cells are that have the the interest calculation or the whatever it is. So you don't want to hard code those in. A much better formula, of course, is, hey, let's take our amount times our rate. Not only that, not only do you want to actually put it in a cell, you want to label it also. So when you come back later or someone using the spreadsheet, they know what's going on. Now, there's an amazing link over here. There's been research done on this topic. Uh, if you go read this link here, it's called. Um, it's an article, The Risk of Spreadsheet Errors. They found it to be the number one contributor to spreadsheet uh, mistakes and faulty spreadsheets. I know from my own experience, it is just havoc when you have to deal with a spreadsheet where you hard code variables into your formula where they really should be put on the face of the spreadsheet and labeled properly. Um, here's an even uh, better example, right? Uh, we want to figure out the net cash in, so we, um, including tax considerations. So we have our original uh, principal 
times the, the interest rate. And then we want to consider taxes. So we take 1 minus uh, the tax rate. That will give us our net cash in from a particular interest revenue. Now, of course, I have some examples down here. Uh, this is just not efficient to actually type those in. And this is even worse, right? Because so you've combined. If you have 0 0.0375, you come back later and you're looking at it, you don't know what the tax rate is, you don't know what the interest rate is. You want to, if you're building a spreadsheet, label, formula inputs, use cell references. All right, let's go look at our next example here. We have revenue and some expenses. I'm going to say equals, go up with my arrow key, get the revenues minus, and I'm going to type a function right in the formula. Now, I'm going to do my up arrow and then hit Shift up arrow, up arrow. So we're seeing for the first cell reference, we just arrowed. But if we want to range, we can click on the first cell and while holding Shift, arrow, 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 and then close parentheses. Now in this formula, equal sign cell reference, op math operator, a function, and then a range of cells. Control Enter. That gives us our answer. Let's go look at our next example. Now, this is going to be an example of a logical formula. Are these two in balance? I'm going to say equals. Now, the equal sign as the first character in a cell when you're in edit mode makes a formula. But anytime you put another equal sign, it's considered a comparative operator. So I'm going to say is whatever's in C122 equal to D22? Control Enter. False. <laughs> Well, I can see with my own eyes that these are in balance. Ah, but when I see something like this, I immediately suspect number formatting. That's why we have logical formulas like this. Lots of accountants everywhere are checking their work. If I were to highlight this and decrease decimals, I'm going to, I'm sorry, increase decimals, Alt 2, a bunch, and I can see, you know, there's an extraneous decimal. Now, it may not be number formatting, but at least the formula signals that there's a problem, something isn't in balance. So I changed it, Control Enter, and maybe I'll highlight this and Alt 1 1. This logical formula, very useful, tells us that there's some trouble and we need to investigate. All right, uh, next type of formula. So we've seen calculating, which gives us a number answer a logical formula, which gives us true or false. Ah, how about a text formula? There's lots of great examples for text formulas. Here's one we have first and last. And we need to combine them in one cell. How about an equal sign? And we'll go get whatever's in this cell, and we'll join it using the join symbol, Shift-7, the ampersand. And I'm going to join it with whatever's in cell D134. Now. A join symbol will take whatever's in that cell and this cell, put it together, Control Enter. It joined two things, but we really need three things. So I'm going to hit F2. That is the keyboard shortcut to put a formula in edit mode. I'm going to come right up to the ampersand, and I need a space. Any text, including the space character, has to be put in double quotes if you're going to use it in a formula. So double quotes, both space, double quote, and then a second ampersand because we're joining three things. Control Enter. And now I want to copy this down the column. This is the selection cursor. If I take my selection cursor and move it towards, towards the lower right-hand corner, there's that little fill handle. My cursor gets close, ah, and it turns to a crosshair, or I like to call it an angry rabbit. You can double click and send it down. It'll copy the formula down the column. As long as there's something to the left, the right, or below it, it'll copy until it sees an empty cell and stop. All right, let's look at our next formula example. Here's an example. We have some numbers, and we want to count how many are greater than 350. Now, this formula input has a comparative operator and a number together in the cell. You can see it's a line to the left. It looks like it's being considered text. I'm going to say, well, wait a second. I want to make a formula. I can use the built-in function COUNTIF. Now, COUNTIF has been around a long time. I simply highlight the range, comma, and the criteria. Whoop, it will count with one condition. Control Enter. There are two. Now, in this case, it's perfectly all right to combine these two. There's a bunch of D functions, uh, D sum, D counter. They're very nice, and they uh, like to, to combine 
comparative operators and numbers like this, but there's some cases where you don't want that. Here's an example here. Um, we have a 350 here, and we need to use that as a number in other formulas. So here we're going to use the same count if, but we're going to have to take our range and combine a number. I'm going to type a comma, get to the next the criteria argument. The number, ah, but I need the comparative operator before it. So in double quotes, I'm going to say greater than, in double quote, and join it using the ampersand. That's the construction for functions like count if, sum if, count ifs with an s, sum ifs, average if. You can combine right in your formula. Now, if you know anything about formulas and you use some product to do array calculations, this is not how you do it for those type of formulas. But for the count if and the formula similar, that's how you have to combine a comparative operator and a number formula input. Or actually, you can have other types of inputs, too. That will give us the same thing. Now, why do we have to do it that way? Well, I have a formula over here. You know what? I'm going to uh, show you the clear. So here's home. There's the clear. I want to get rid of all the formatting because it's hard to read that formula there. Clear. The eraser does everything. Uh, actual content, either formula or data, and the formatting. For, clear formatting does just the formatting and clear contents. That's like the delete key. So I'm going to say clear formats. And if I put this in edit mode, I can see I've joined some text and what's ever in that cell. What's nice about this, and I'm going to Control-Z to put that formatting, is if I come here and type 475, Enter, our text formula updates, our calculating formula updates. So that's awesome. If we had a comparative operator there, this formula wouldn't work out so well. All right, let's look at our next formula example. We are going to look at the sum ifs function. Now in 2007 and later, there's sum ifs, count ifs, and average ifs. They all make calculations with one or more condition. Now let's do a formula here. We want to add from this column based on two conditions. I'm going to type equals sum. Now notice there's this drop down. We've seen it a few times already, but I haven't mentioned it. You can arrow through this. And once you find a function you want, you can hit tab. Now let's just look at sum if. This has been around forever. It only adds with one condition. Notice the screen tip, range and sum range. I'm going to uh, backspace, down arrow, and hit tab. And compare that. This is a screen tip. And the actual descriptions in the screen tips are much more explicit. Sum range, criteria range. It's clear which is which. So not only is the screen tip more polite, but we can do one or more conditions. So I tend to use sum ifs all the time now for one or two or three conditions. Now the sum range, I simply highlight the range there, comma, criteria range. Now this is and criteria, which means both conditions must be true. You can enter them into the sum ifs function in any order you want. I'm going to say the sales rep column for criteria range, comma, and then the criteria for that column. Criteria 2 will be product. That's the whole range, comma, and then the criteria will be criteria 2. Control Enter, and there we go. If we change this, of course, it will update. There aren't, Celia did not sell any product twos. All right, so look at our next example. Hey, we're going to use the sum ifs again, but we want to talk about between criteria. Here's a column of dates, and we want to count between a lower and upper date. So I'm going to come here and use sum ifs, the sum range. Hey, we're counting units. And guess what? The criteria range 1 and 2 will both be dates, comma, and the criteria. Now notice what we did here. I actually typed this out. Greater than or equal to 9 slash 22. So this is text. But the sum ifs will properly interpret that as greater than or equal to that date. That is not a serial number sitting in the cell. It's actually text. That'll be our first criteria. Criteria range 2 is the date, and there is our upper value. Now notice we've included an equal sign. There's no single greater than or equal to or less than or equal. There's two characters in both of those cases. When you're doing between criteria, you got to be careful. Sometimes you want to include the upper and lower. Other times you want to only include one, either the lower or the upper. 
All right, Control-Enter, and that will add between those two dates. If you have actual serial numbers, then you have to do the construction where we use comparative operators and join them to our criteria. All right, so our criteria range both time is going to be dates. And watch this. For our criteria, I'm going to say greater than or equal to all in double quotes and then join it. This is a serial number. So up here, some ifs properly interpreted this text. Here it will properly interpret the serial number joined to the text. Now, watch this. Here's a great trick. If you have a certain uh, function argument that you have and you want to highlight, you can click on the screen tip and highlight it. Not only that, but you can evaluate it to see what it is, what it evaluates to, what the formula thinks it is. I'm going to hit the F9 key. That's evaluate. Now, I want to immediately undo that using Control Z. But just for a moment, see, that's much different than this. And some ifs, count ifs, all those functions will interpret it correctly, Control Z. All right, comma, we get our date our range for a second time. Now I'm going to do criteria in double quotes, less than or equal to in double quotes join. And there's our serial number. Close parentheses and Control Enter. Very useful. Sometimes you have to uh, summarize by months, and you can have a column of begin and end, or years, or whatever it is. Now let's do our third example. We want to count between 1,000 and 1,500 all of the units that fall within this category. For this one, however, we will include the lower limit but not the upper limit. So we'll see some ifs. We're going to get our sum range. And guess what? All three times we will highlight the units column. So sum range, and then we have two criterias on this. Between criteria is one way to think of it, and criteria. Both of these have to be uh, met. So double quotes, greater than or equal to, and double quotes, and join it to the lower limit. And we'll highlight the units for a third time. That's our criteria two, comma, and then greater than in double quotes. Join with our upper limit. All right, and there we, uh, that's the sum of all of the units that were between these upper and lower. All right, useful to do between or and criteria like that. Let's go ahead and look at our next example. This is um, an example where we have a new function in Excel 2010 called Workdays International. Now, what we'd like is to be able to count for a project between a start and an end. We have some holidays, and our weekend is Sunday not Saturday and Sunday. So we use the networking days. Now, networking days has been around uh, long before 2010, but it only considers the weekend Saturday and Sunday. So this new function is just awesome. Down arrow, tab. We give it our start, our end, comma, our weekends. And there it is, this beautiful drop down. We can select whichever we want. I'm going to double click 11. Finally, our holidays. I'm going to go ahead and highlight. And notice some of them are empty, just in case uh, next time we use this template, we need some extra holidays there. Those empty cells will not interfere with the correct calculation. Now, we're going to copy this formula down the column. And these two are relative cell references. As we copy down, the formula needs to look two to my left and one to my left. But this range needs to be locked or absolute. Now, the way you do that is you add dollar signs for all of the column and row references. Now, the quick way to do it is just hit the F4 key. Boom, it puts the dollar signs in everywhere. That means when we copy this, it will not move relatively. Control Enter. I'm going to double click and send it down. Now, relative cell references, those blue and green ones are still looking relative to me. The formula, where am I going to look? One cell to my left. And I'm sorry, two cells to my left and one cell to my left, whereas this one was locked in every single cell or absolute. Now, it most people know relative references and absolute. If you know the different, you know how to use those, you can make spreadsheets quickly. However, there are two other major types of cell references that help you speed up formula creation time. Now, let's go look at an example. Um, the four types of cell references are relative absolute, mixed with the column locked, but not the row, and mixed with the row locked, but not the column. Now, if you're new to this, and most people are, the vast majority of Excel users on the planet Earth do not use mixed cell references. I have 
this epic video at YouTube. Um, and in the Slain Excel Dragons, there's a whole section on mixed cell references. But there's a good uh, resource there. All right, so here's the situation. We have percentages for our four expenses. And we have our revenues. Now, most times, people would make a formula like this. In fact, I teach classes and all the textbooks I use say, hey, teach them this way. I want to copy this down the column. So I need every one of these cells to be looking at the revenue. So I'm going to hit the F4 key. And then multiply by your first expense. Now, the order in which these are orientated has to be the same as the assumption area. But that's a relative cell reference. Control Enter, double click, and send it down. When I F2 the last cell, boom, one locked, one apps, uh, relative. This is absolute, this is not. But what that means is for formula creation time, you then have to come over here, F4 times this, and oh. That means I have to do it five times. You know, for big budgets with 12 months, I want to be able to do one formula and copy it down and over. For a whole year, if I can choose or create one formula in one cell and copy it throughout the range, I can do it 12 times faster than someone that only knows relative and absolute. Now, this is a hard topic. I've been teaching this a long time, so it just takes practice. But here we go. I'm just going to build the basic formula, all right? So I have these two cell references right here. Now, the way I do it is I ask a question, not just one, but two questions of each cell reference. Because here's what we're doing. Our goal is to copy the formula down and over. Uh, when I copy it down, I'm copying it across the rows. When I'm copying it to the side, I'm copying it across the columns. So I'm going to ask two questions, because there's only two directions in Excel, up and down across the rows and left and right across the columns. So I'm going to ask a question. When I copy this formula down, do I need it locked on D226? The answer is yes. So then I go through the copy motion. I am copying down across the rows or numbers. That immediately tells me that the dollar sign should be in front of the number. Now the F4 key, if you hit it one time, it puts in 2. But hit it again, it puts in, oh, just the dollar sign in front of the row. In fact. It's a toggle or a merry-go-round key. As I keep hitting F4, it just merry-go-rounds through all of the four major types of cell references. So I'm going to stop with only the dollar sign in front of the number. That means when I copy it down across the numbers, it's locked on 226. Now, the second question is when I copy it to the side, do I want it locked or do I want it relative? Well, think about this. When this gets over to this cell, should it still be locked on January? Or should it move to February? It should move to February, so no dollar sign in front of the D. Same here, two questions. When I copy D233 down, do I want it to move relatively? Yes. I'm copying down across the numbers, so no dollar sign in front of that number. Now, when I copy to the side, across the letters, do I want the D to move to E and then to F? No. I would need to put a dollar sign in front of the column reference to lock it down only when we're going across the column. So I hit the F4 key until I only see a dollar sign in front of the letter and not the number. That is the formula. Mix cell references. This one has only the row lock but not the column. This one has only the column but not the row. Control Enter. Copy it down. Now, this is a trick, too. You can't copy it Control-Z. You can't go like this. You can't use your fill handle or angry rabbit to copy it in two directions. You actually have to copy it one, let go, and then copy it in another. Control-Z, Z. I'm going to delete it. Another way to do this, if you highlight all the cells that are going to get the one formula, and then the active cell, you build your formula, equals up arrow, F4, F4, times, down, 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 F4, F4, F4. Now I have my formula in the active cell. To populate it into all the cells, I use Control and Enter. Now, when you copy a formula to a range like this, you always want to go to the diagonally furthest one away from the active cell and hit the F2 key. And admi check 
to see if you have the right cell references. In our case, we're going to admire. That is amazing. It got exactly the right cell references. Now, there is a keyboard. If you control Enter, that's called the active cell. Control period moves the active cell from corner to corner. So I can use control period, period, and then F2 to check it. By the way, that control period is great for huge data sets when you need to you know, go around the edges. All right, uh, let's look at some lookup formulas next. All right, let's scroll down. Our first example will involve the lookup function VLOOKUP. Now, lookup functions and formulas are usually taught in an advanced Excel class, but they're not that hard. Let's look at a simple example we've all done. We've all done lookup sometime in our life, whether looking up an employee's name to get a telephone number or a product name to get a price or a tax table or something like that. In this case, in this cell, we're going to have to look up this product for, find it in the first column. Then that will determine the row, which row in the table we're then going to jump over, get this 30 bucks, and bring it back to the cell. That's fundamentally what lookup functions do. They look something up, retrieve something from a table or column. All right, so the function we're going to look at is VLOOKUP. I'm going to type VL. I immediately see it, and I drop down, so I hit Tab. Now, the V means vertical, because the table is orientated vertically. Lookup, it means we're doing some lookup. Now, the screen tips are just like we do it by hand, right? Lookup value, that's just the thing we need to look at, remember in our brain, comma. The table, well, we need to know where the table is. Now, this table, first column has the thing we're going to actually match. We're getting a match. Product 4, broop, that tells us row 4. The second, third, fourth, fifth, or sometimes there's big tables like employee data, there may be many columns. In our situation, we just have a two column table comma, column index number. That is which column right there has the thing we want to get and bring back to the cell. Well, for us, it's 1, 2. So you simply type a 2 here. If this was a tax table and our table had five columns and the tax rate was in the fourth column, you'd put a 4 there, comma. Now you have approximate match. That's for income taxes and commissions and things like that, or exact match. When you're looking up text, or tables that are not sorted, you use exact match. Now, this table is technically sorted, but we want to exactly find PRO space 4. So we're going to use exact match. Now, if the table was always sorted and you wanted to find pr exactly product space 4, you could use approximate match. And in fact, if it's, you have lots of lookups and the tables are huge, it's advantageous to sort your first column and use approximate match. But in most cases, you don't want to risk it. You want to just look up exactly product 4 and use false. Now, another thing, false also can be represented with a 0, and true can be represented with a 1. So I tend to use a 0 instead of false when I'm using exact match. That also matches some of the other lookup functions that require you use a 0 for false or exact match. All right, so VLOOKUP, that's what it looks like. Boom, it got the 30. If I change this to 2, it goes over, it finds the 2, jumps over the second column, gets it, and brings it back to the cell. Now, what if you're a bad typer like I am, and you type no space? The VLOOKUP function and uh, the other lookup functions are polite. It says, hey, it's not available. Hey, I couldn't find that in my list. So what we would like, instead of having to type a space, is we'd like to avoid that in the first place. So we can add something called data validation list. Now, the great thing about VLOOKUP is we already have the table here. That list says exactly what things should be allowed in that cell. In that case, we can simply highlight the cell, go to data, and then data validation and data validation. Now, you could learn the keyboard, uh, Alt keyboard shortcut in this version. And it's a good keyboard shortcut. But if you are a keyboard junkie, the keyboard shortcut from earlier versions of Excel is shorter than the Alt keyboard you would use in 2007 or 10. It's Alt-DL, Alt-DL. 
Now, the default is allow any value. We don't want to allow any value. We want a list. Now, there's a bunch of other cool things that data validation can do, but in this case, we want a list. There's the source. We simply click in this text box and then highlight our range. Now, notice there's an in cell drop down. That would be awesome and convenient. You could put an input message, which means as soon as you selected the cell, a message would show up. You could even put an error alert. Uh, type whatever you want here and there. Um, and then if you type something incorrect, this will pop up in the dialog box. You can even have, have a little fun with that. I'm going to click OK. So now, look at this. If I select product 3, it instantly updates. And I pretty much can't put something uh, that's not from the draft time. Now, technically, you can copy and paste from another cell and overwrite the, um, the data validation. But if I type something here, that message pops up. Pretty cool. All right. now. What if we didn't have data validation? Or in some cases, you have an empty cell, like an empty uh, template. So our VLOOKUP, if we were looking here in this table right here, comma, column 2, comma, 0, exact match, we get an NA. So in some and uh, product 10, as we saw, that's going to be NA2. So in some cases, you don't want to see this NA. You want to see something different. There's a great function. Excel 2007 or later, if error. Now, the great thing about if error is it just evaluates the VLOOKUP. If it's not an error, it will deliver that to the cell, the result of the VLOOKUP. Otherwise, you come to the end and you tell it, right? in if error, hey, what do you want to see in the cell if it's an error? Now, there's a couple ways we could go. In fact, there's all sorts of things we could put here. Double quote, double quote is the syntax for nothing. That is. Just like we saw our text ele formula elements earlier, except for there's nothing there, not even a space. It's a null text string with zero length. So it'll show an empty cell. You could also, if you had data validation, put something like select. Well, that wouldn't pop up. You might put something uh, like not in list. So in this case, we're not using data validation, not in list. All right, but if we put product. Three, boom, it goes and gets the price. All right, now that's exact match, approximate match. You have um, all sorts of situations where you have uh, a table. Could be commissions like in our uh, situation right here. So these are the different amounts. These are the commissions you get. Or tax tables, um, lots of other examples. Square footage tables, for example. But here, the trick is you actually have you have to list the items in ascending order from smallest to biggest. And really, when you think about looking this up, we need to get the commission rate and put it here. Well, if we're looking this up, which one of these categories does it fit within? Because VLOOKUP is going to require that we put the numbers this way and not some category like greater than or equal to 2,000 but less than 10,000. Now, if you have your table set up that way, you have to have it as an extra column that's not included in the lookup. But here's the deal. This is really convenient. And here's the way to think about it. If we do equals VLOOKUP and look this up doing approximate match, what VLOOKUP is going to do is take that number, race through the first column in the table, and when it bumps into the first bigger number, it knows to jump back. Now, technically, that's not what it does. It does um, a search where it divides the table in half, and it's actually really fast. It doesn't have to look through every item like with an exact match. But for understanding, Races down, bumps into the first bigger one, and jumps back a row. That's how it determines the row with approximate match. That's why we were allowed to have gaps in between. There's lots of numbers between 2,000 and 10,000 that we might uh, consider for a commission rate of 0 0.04. All right, so the table's the same. We still only have a two column table, and the second column has the thing I want to retrieve. Now we can put true, but we don't really have to, or a one, but we don't really have to. If you know the default for this function, you can leave it out. The default is approximate match. Now, there's a hint in every screen tip. If you see square brackets around the argument, that means if you know what the default is and that's what you'd like, you can just flat out leave that argument out. So when doing approximate match, we don't need that last argument. Only one, two, three, the first three arguments.
And so now, whatever we put in here, 2,500, 7,000. But if I type exactly 10,000, what it does is it has to take this, race through the table. When it bumps into the first bigger one, it jumps back one. Two other examples. If you ha In this case, you would never put a, a negative number. But if you put a number smaller than the first one, it's going to give you an NA. But conveniently, of course, someone could sell more than 15,000. So the way it's programmed is if it's bigger than the last one, no problem. It races through. It can't find a bigger one, so it just takes the last one. All right, so that's approximate match. Let's look at another great example for lookup. Oftentimes, you have a table, and you want to retrieve multiple records. But look at here. If I'm doing VLOOKUP to look up this ID, so I'm going to find uh, this ro third row right here. Well, the first name is in the second column. The last name is in the third column. And the email is in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth column. So I could easily do this. VLOOKUP. Now, I'm going to look this up. I'm going to copy this to the side. F4, that's perfectly all right here, because you're going to copy and it'll be locked. If you want to be hardcore, we only need the column reference C, because as we copy this way, we're not copying it down. We only need the C lock. Our table, I'm going to highlight the whole table. F4 to lock in all directions, because I'm going to copy this formula. Now, right now, first is 2. So I'm simply going to do 2, and then comma 0 for exact match. All right. Um, it, yeah, so these are not sorted. So I'm not going to mess around and do that. But watch this as I copy it over. Then I can come and change this one to 3, and this one to, I think that's 8, right? So there we go. We have built a formula to retrieve a record or some information from a record. When I change the uh, ID here, it all changes. Now, in many cases, especially if you're doing this all the time or you have you know, lots of uh, formulas, you don't want to have to hard code this in, 3, or go and edit them. Not only that, but sometimes you have situations where this formula input I mean, it should be a formula input, and we shouldn't manually have to say, hey, that's in the second column. There's a function that will actually look up an item and tell you the relative position of the item in a list, and it's called the match function. It is a lookup function, but it looks something up. We're looking up the field name, comma, within uh, one way array, I'm going to highlight from ID all the way to the end, only the field names, and hit F4. Now look, it's only got one dimension, meaning there's one row, eight columns. So it can find the relative position. It actually looks for first, goes, hey, that's not first, but the second one is. So it will report a 2, the relative position of an item in a list. comma, And this is where you have to. This is the other lookup function that uses 1, 0, and negative 1. We're going to use exact match 0. These field names are not sorted and never will be. That's it. Control Enter and copy it over. By itself, it seems ridiculous. Relative position, why would you ever want that? But this is perfect for that third argument in VLOOKUP. So watch this. I'm going to copy this in edit mode, not the equal sign, just the match. Control C, Escape. And then I'm going to come here, click on that column index, or highlight that too, and Control V to paste. So now we put match inside the column index inside of VLOOKUP. Control Enter and copy this over. Now, in this situation, you may never want to change these, but you could absolutely type now city. And this is the essence of Excel. Formula input, when I change it, the formula updates. So that's looking up a record. Finally, for our, la our couple more examples, and this is a really common question. Certainly at YouTube over the years, this is one of the more common questions I, I've received. You have list 2 and list 1, and we need to compare these. Well. We want to, in our case, take these prospective customer lists and compare it to the list for the company. Right? We've been trying to get these people to become customers. Well, we can see that PCC 
is already in the master list. So what we'd like is to compare these. If So the question is going to be for each one of these elements in list 2, is item in list 2 in list 1? We can use the match function. Not the math function, not the math. The match function. I'm going to look this item up, comma, within this whole list. Notice just a moment ago, we saw that match did a one way with many columns. Now we're doing a one way with many rows. I'm going to hit the F4, and then comma, 0, not sorted. So what does it say? NA means, guess what? That item is not in this list. This number says that item is in this list. Now, oftentimes, this is all you need. The numbers, um, or the, in our case, if these were prospective customers, the numbers mean I don't need to phone them anymore. The NAs mean I should still phone them, right? But in some cases, you want the NAs. In other cases, you want the twos. So we can take our match. And actually, uh, notice that that's a relative cell reference. That's absolute. I can actually copy this cell and paste it right here. Notice the relative works perfect. The absolute works perfect. So I'm going to copy this down. I'm going to do the same thing here, Control-V. I'm actually going to copy this whole column, Control-C, Control-V. So if you don't want the messiness of NA and numbers, now, I actually like to turn those dancing ants off. I'm going to use Escape. Now, this is the same question we had up here. Is the item in list 2 also in list 1? So I want to know, is PCC here? True. So I'm interested in the numbers. So I can wrap put match inside the is number function. There's a set of logical functions that start with is. And it will these functions will deliver true or false. Because it's is number, the numbers will get a true. The NAs, or anything that's not a number, will get a false. If you're interested in the NAs, which if you had a customer list, these are the people I still want to call. In that case, an NA is good. And sure enough, is there an is NA? You betcha. And then Control, Enter, and double click, sending that, send it down. So very important concept of comparing two lists. The match function can do it. Is number can help, and so can is NA. All right, our last example before we move on to our next topic. Sometimes you have to look up something to the left. Now V lookup. Oh, look at that. There's a. Um, so I'll edit while I'm uh, filming here. Um, you need to look something up. And it's the thing you want to retrieve is not in a column that's to the right of the lookup column. In this case, hey, there's the name of the product right here. And I want to retrieve ID. Now, in many cases, you just move this column over here and build your VLOOKUP based on the first column. But if you can't, here's a great solution. Now, we saw how match works, and we saw how VLOOKUP works. Another incredibly useful function is index. Now, index is great. You give it an array of values. We're not going to talk about this one. This is when you have multiple tables. By the way, I have a playlist of almost uh, 90 examples of, of lookup. Everything under the sun, uh, lookup left, uh, lookups when you return multiple items, looking up pictures. So this playlist of videos has uh, five or six videos with 90s examples of almost every lookup example I can think of. All right. And this one's in that. But here, this is the more common one. We're going to give it an array. Now, this can be a two-way or a one-way. And then you give the index function the row number and the column number, and it retrieves the intersecting value. Now, in our case, we're going to use uh, the array of values that we want to retrieve. It's only going to be one way. So I'm simply going to highlight 1, 2, 3. There's one column and three rows. Then I simply tell it which row the item is in. Well, guess what? Match comes to the rescue. I say, hey, match, look up boom 3, comma, within the product column. It'll determine 1, 2, or 3. Feed that as a relative position. And I'm going to assume these are not sorted. Feed that as a relative position into the row number. Now, really, that's also 
uh, it's the row number from that particular table there, that blue table, one, two, or three. So actually, I would have liked it better if they called this relative position, because it's not 319, 320. OK, so match. And by the way, we can highlight this. And let's do our evaluation trick, F9. It's telling the index, please go get the third item from this array right there. Now, be sure and undo this Control Z. You don't want to leave that hard coded. We don't have a column number. We're not doing a two-way lookup, so we can simply leave that out. That's a lookup left. That's a great solution for that. Notice here I used the indent feature right there, because sometimes it's annoying when you're selecting and uh, if with this drop down kind of hangs over. There's other ways to s solve this. Sometimes people put extra columns. All right, that's a lot about formulas and lookups. Now let's go over and talk about pivot tables. Let's click on the sheet PT data. Oh, pivot tables, the most powerful feature in Excel. And guess what? The rumor for pivot tables through the history of pivot tables, and even back to Lotus uh, Improv, is that they're hard to create. And I'm here to tell you they are not hard at all. A few simple tips, and you will see that pivot tables are like the easiest thing and the most powerful thing in Excel. Now, before we can look at pivot tables, you first got to understand that the data that you're going to use for a pivot table has to be in a certain format. You have to have field names at the top and records in rows. Now, the field names don't necessarily need to be at the top, meaning the first row here, but they do have to be at the top of each column. You also have to have empty cells all the way around the data set, Control Z, or uh, the column headers or the row headers. The big mistake people will make is you'll have a note with some note here right next to your data set. Notice how it's touching one of the cells in the data set. Or as we often like to do, we make our calculations off to the side, some calculation. You cannot do that. I'm going to Control Escape and then Control Z. You got to have empty cells all the way around or column headers or row headers. You also don't want to obviously have an empty column or row. You do want to try and avoid empty cells, although you can definitely make a pivot table with empty cells. We'll look at a couple problems that that will cause. And you definitely want don't want to have empty field names. So if you get a data set without a field name, put a field name, some name that describes what the data in this column is. All right, now let's learn the most important tip for seeing that pivot to creating pivot tables is really quite easy. The trick is to visualize the report in advance before you start creating your pivot table. Here's a table. We've all seen tables like this. It's a cross-tabulated table. Here are sales rep names. Here are the regions. An intersecting cell is in our case, we're adding. It is adding with one, two conditions. These are called row headers. These are called column headers. So for a cross-tabulated report, we're adding. We're going to add on the units column. This number, 1344, was calculated looking for FAM in the Midwest. So if we look at our, our records here, FAM in the Midwest, there are two. It went through for the region column, and any time it found a Midwest. And then in the sales rep column, it found a FAM. It used the units in calculating that number. And it went through the entire data set. Any time it found both of those, it used it in that calculation. All right, so what's so important about visualizing in, in advance? These are row headers. At the head of this row is FAM. At the head of this column or the top of this column is Midwest. These, this came from the region column. This came from the sales rep column. So when we go to create our pivot table, and this is what the end result will be, we simply are going to take, there'll be a list of field names. We're going to put region as column header, sales rep as row header. And the units will go in the calculating area or the values area. All right, let's do it. Let's see a pivot table. 
I'm going to click in a single cell. I'm making sure that there's empty cells all the way, all the way around. In fact, control down arrow, right? OK, I'm good. Control home. Any single cell will work. Now I'm going to go to Insert, Pivot Table, Pivot Table. I'm going to use my keyboard shortcut from now on, Alt-NVT. We learned that earlier in uh, the keyboard section. Now, this dialog replaced earlier dialogs that had three steps. It's guessing. And it will always guess right if you have blanks all the way around and, and column headers and or column headers or row headers. So it will always guess right. We don't have an external source, so we're not going to click there. We do want it on a new sheet. We'll see later how you can put it on an existing sheet. You simply uh, click here. you got to be careful, though, because if there's anything below it, it might get replaced. I'm going to say New Sheet and then Enter. Now watch this. Alt-NVT, Enter. That's how it should go for you after you uh, create pivot tables for a while. Now it immediately puts Sheet 1. I'm going to go ahead and call this First pivot. Now obviously, if you had a particular name, you might give it a, a better name. But naming sheets is always very important. I just double click that and typed and hit Enter. All right, now this is the field list. And check this out. They give you all of the fields here. That's why they're so important. How would you uh, know where to drop the fields if they didn't have names? And look at this, row labels. And it even gives you a little color-coded picture. Those are the rows. These are the column. And there's the value. It uses that sigma sum uh, Greek letter character to indicate that this is where it's going to make the calculation. So what do we do? Region, where did it go? In the columns. Now notice I'm dragging. Dragging, no, 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 that no symbol, and then boom. Notice it even in the icon there, that blue strip is at the top saying that sits in the column. Instantly, we have a unique list of our regions. Now we take our sales rep. It says, no, 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 no. I could drop it there, and we'll talk about that later, but I want it in the row labels. Instantly, a unique list of sales rep names. Then we take our units, and we drag it there. That is unbelievable. With a quick keyboard and three drags of our mouse, we have created an amazing pivot table. And that really is how easy it is. Again, and it also depends on you understanding row labels, column labels in a cross table tabulated type of table. Now, immediately in uh, 2007, 10, and 13, there's a problem here. It says row labels and column labels instead of listing the field name. So you immediately, you just have to have this as an automatic reflex. Go to Design, go to Report Layout, Show in Tabular Form. And you know, there's no way that I've ever seen to set this as the default, but watch. Boop. Much better. Much better. We can see the field names there. Now, we'll do that many times um, throughout this video, so you'll, we'll get used to it. But there you go. Now we have our cross-tabulated pivot table. Now, notice that we have some numbers here. If we wanted to add number formatting, we could highlight this and do Control-1, but that would format the cells only and not the actual field. So the more, more efficient way to do this is, and there's a few ways to access um, field settings. You could go to the Options, Pivot Table Tools, and Field Settings. You could go right-click Value Field Settings. That's what I uh, tend to do. I'm going to open up the value field settings. And we'll see this a bunch because we're going to look at a bunch of examples. You can change the field name here. Now, if you wanted to, uh, let's just change the field name. I'm just going to put sum. Well, you could change the function. We'll talk about this uh, show values as. That's a different types of, type of calculating. But there's the number formatting. you got to click that. So it's a couple extra clicks rather than doing Control-1. But even though this looks the same, we are actually adding the number formatting to the field. So when we learn how to pivot our table and move it around, the number formatting will stick. All right, I'm going to click on Number, and then decrease the decimal, and use a comma. Click OK. Click OK. 
So there are our units. That was adding number formatting. Now, style, there's a bunch of built-in styles up here. You can select whichever one you want. I usually go pretty minimal. There's some built-in styles. Um, so you see if you click one here or whichever style you like, uh, it'll immediately apply that style. Now, the problem with pivot table styles is they're, they're not very good. So I like to come down to the bottom here, and I think you can't see that. That's off the screen. You click on this uh, More button here. Right down at the bottom is New Pivot Table Style. I'm going to click on that, but I'm going to scoot this back down here. More, and then New Pivot Table Style. Now we can give it a name. I'm going to call it My Style. Even though I don't have any style, now I can have Pivot Table Style. And I select whichever element in the pivot table I would like. Now you can read through this list and format whatever you want. I tend to be a minimalist. I'm going to select header row. That's this right here. Click the format. And I have font, border, and fill. I'm going to do a dark fill. If I do a dark fill, you've got to have a light font. Click OK. Scroll down. There's a bunch of great things column subheadings, row subheadings. I'm just going to go right to the bottom. That's the very bottom here, grand total. Say Format, and let's do some borders. A thick dark line at the top, double line at the bottom. Click OK. If you don't like your formatting, you can click Clear and Start Over. There's a preview here. I'm going to click OK. Set as default pivot table quick style for this document. I like that, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to call this My Style 2 since I already have a My Style in there. All right, click OK. Now I can simply come up here. Oh, look, there's my first style there. It's the same. I'm going to click this My Style. If you hover, you'll see the screen tip. My Style 2, and instantly. I have created my own style. I'm not limited to these uh, built-in styles. Now, two more things about a pivot table. The first is, hey, why do they call it a pivot table in the first place anyway? Hey, your boss comes in, sees the sales rep sitting in the row headers, and they're like, those are supposed to be in the column. No problem. You can pivot the report. You simply click and drag the field and drag it to whichever section you want. Now, notice down in the row, I see that gray bar. I can drag it below or above. If I drag it above, I get two fields dropped here. And look at that. Sometimes this is just the report you want. Of course, the boss doesn't want it this way. But i got to show you one other thing about this particular view here. There's these Collapse buttons. So you can collapse and see not only the individual detail for each employee, but you can collapse them and see just the East total. You could also right click, expand or collapse, and here it allows you to expand the entire field or collapse the entire field. So just like that, you can pivot your report, expand entire field. All right, so the boss doesn't want that either, but that's pretty cool. Pivoting. Now I'm going to drag the sales rep up to the column labels, and boom, those, the boss has exactly the report they want. Now, what if, in this case, we're adding, right? We're adding on the units column based on two conditions. What if I wanted to change the calculation to average or count? I could simply come up to Options, Field Settings. I could right click and summarize values by. Or I could right click, and we saw this before, the value field settings. Here you can change the name, the function, the number format. So I'm going to change it to count, and just like that, boom, I've changed the calculation. All right, I'm going to Control Z and leave it a sum. All right, let's go to our actual data sheet. I'm going to click on this PT data, and we're going to create our second pivot table. Now, with this pivot table, we want to make a calculation based on three conditions. And we want to see how to do filtering. Now, as always, it's helpful to visualize your report first. So we would like to have region in the row labels and product. So two fields in the row headers or row labels. And then we want our sales rep over as the column headers or column labels. I'm going to click in a single cell in my data set and use our keyboard. Alt, NVT, Enter. All right, here's our field list. 
simply take our region and drag it down to row, our product and drag it down to row, sales rep, drag it over to column. Instantly, it's looking just like we visualized. Now we're going to make a calculation upon sales. So I'm going to drag that to the values area. All right, now let's do some formatting. I want some sort of number formatting. So I'm going to right click value field settings, number format. These are uh, This is a sales field. So I'm going to show it in some currency. I'm, I don't need to see any uh, decimals. So I'm going to sh show zero decimals, click OK. Click OK. Immediately go to Design, Report Layout, and Show in Tabular. We want to see those field names. Now filtering. There's two ways we can filter. One is we can filter upon the fields. They have this drop down. It's amazing. Now I'm going to scoot this over to the side. Click on Region. Actually, before we filter it, let's look over here. See the totals. What we'd like to see is I don't want to see all of the regions. I just want the top. Two. So filters have two couple parts. You can sort. You could actually manually uncheck and check to filter. There's label filters for the filters and value filters. These will filter the values in no way. Down at the bottom, top 10. I don't want top 10, so I'm going to only show the top two. Click OK. And just like that, that's amazing. I filtered my pivot table. Now I'm going to unfilter, clear. That's a, an excellent way to go with filtering. But there's an, another amazing filter here, report filter. Now right now, we're at, um, these are adding sales based on three conditions. But watch this. I'm going to take the customer and drop it down to the report filter. Immediately, it will add something above the pivot table that will filter the whole pivot table. I'm going to drop it there. Instantly, it shows up here. Click this drop down. I can select any one of these. When I select BBT, it will add a fourth condition. Click OK. This pivot table is four conditions. The, so for this value right here, it's salesperson Franks, product sunshine East, and sold to BBT customer. I can click this and uh, say all. You can also select multiple items, and then there's a checklist, and you can check, uncheck all and check whichever ones you want. Now, this is, I'm going to unselect this. This is a report filter. In just a moment, I will show you a slicer. And the slicer is much easier than this. But there's a great advantage. When you have your filter here, let's say your boss comes in and says, I would like you to create there, let's say there's 20 customers. I want you to create a pivot table for each customer. That means you have 20 sheets. I'm going to click OK here. Let's name this. This is not a good name. I'm going to call this uh, second pivot, just second pivot, Enter. So I typed it and hit Enter. Now again, the boss wants 20 individual pivot tables, one for each customer. There's an amazing feature, and it's been around a long time in pivot tables. I'm going to go in 2010 to Options, and then to Options and Show Report Filter Pages. In earlier versions, it used to be called Show Page Filters. Now I'm going to click this, and we only have one uh, report filter. We could have dropped multiple filters down here. With that selected, I'm going to click OK. But before I click OK, I'm even going to drag it down here instantly. 20 sheets will show up in front or to the, the left of this sheet. Watch this. I'm going to click OK and watch down here. Instantly, we have an individual pivot table for each customer. I'm, I'm using Control Page Down Abs with even the customer name on the sheet. Absolutely amazing. Now you can see why they call it the most powerful feature because you know, with a couple clicks and then knowing where that options for report filter is, wow, that is amazing. Now, let's go back here and look at a slicer. Now, I'm going to have my um, cursor in the pivot table. I want to go to Options and Slicer. Now, here I'm going to say Insert Slicer. I can choose. This is going to do the same thing as the report filter. Here I'm going to say customer, same as I did over there. The only advantage when I click OK is it adds a 
a much more friendly user interface. Now we can come up here to Options, and I can say Columns and increase it to, say, four columns. Expand this out, however, however big I'd like it. I could add some formatting. Absolutely amazing. Now what this does is it will filter it without having to use this. If I click on FM instantly, it'll PCC instantly it will show PCC. Now your the selection tricks that we learned earlier with our um, keyboard and mouse apply here. So here I want to go from AST to EPP. I'm going to hold Shift and then click, and instantly it highlights all of those. If you want to highlight ones that are not next to each other or non-contiguous, you simply use your Control key and click on whichever ones you want. And instantly, the report is filtered using a slicer. Now I'm going to move this over here. OK, so filtering, absolutely amazing, that great option to show uh, report filters as individual sheets. Let's go back to our pivot table data set. We'll click on PT data. Now, before we do our next pivot table, we want to compare and contrast formulas and pivot tables. Now, in our next pivot table, this is the end result. We're going to have months as row headers and region as column headers. Now, look over at the data set. We're not given months. We don't already have it summarized, so we're given daily dates. And we need to somehow summarize from daily dates. The pivot table, you won't believe it. It's just a few clicks, and instantly it can be done. Now, the tr problem with doing this with formulas is that this is a text criteria. JAN doesn't directly match up with serial number dates. So the formula gets a little bit wild. Right there it is. I mean, that's a wild formula. So the advantage to pivot tables here is that they're easy. Well, we've already seen a bunch of examples of how pivot tables are so amazingly easy. So why in the world would you ever do formulas? Well, two reasons. The first reason is in a pivot table, there are only uh, 11 uh, aggregate functions. And then later in the video, we'll see that there's some other ways to calculate. But the calculations that you can do in a pivot table are very limited compared to the nearly infinite capabilities of formulas. Uh, and there's a second reason. Now let's look at Midwest April 1326. Well, the formulas in the pivot table both get the same answer, of course. However, if you change the source data, so let's take April Midwest, that number 49. Again, we get the same number. If we change any formula input, whether it's raw data or our criteria, formulas instantly update. Pivot tables do not instantly update. Now, it's easy to refresh a pivot table, but in many situations, when you're building solutions, you do not want that extra step. You want formulas to update instantly. Let's look at an example. I'm just going to change this to some ridiculous number like 5,000. Let's come over and look at that instantly, the number updated with the formula, but not the pivot table. Now, it's really easy. All you do is right click Refresh, and there's a Refresh button up in the, the Options uh, ribbon up there. Instantly, it updates. But again, for lots of solutions, you want to change something and have it instantly update. In essence, those are the two comparisons. Pivot tables are ridiculously easy. Pivot tables cannot do a lot of calculations that uh, functions can. Pivot tables don't instantly update. Formulas do. All right, now let's go and build this and see just how <laughs> amazingly easy it is. I'm going to change this back to 49. Enter. I better come over here and right click Refresh. And instantly, now we have the same numbers again. All right, let's go over and create our second data set. I'm going to click in a single cell and then use our keyboard shortcut, Alt-N-V-T, Enter. Now, we want to first drag dates to the row labels. Instantly, we have a unique list of dates. And in fact, this is a great trick right here. If you drag sales, you get a daily total. Ah, but that's not what we want. We want to group these 
So all you have to do is right click group. Now, if you have multiple years, you want to be sure and not just select months, but select years also. My rule of thumb is I always select years. When I click OK and then I see that there is only one year, that's my way of checking. Then I grab the years and drag it back up here. There I have months. Now I can drag the region. And I want sales, so I'm going to drag, whoops, look at that. I dragged the, the region down there by mistake, so now I'm going to drag it up here. And instantly, I have my totals. We could format this. I'm going to leave that right there. Now, we want to talk about um, grouping. Sometimes, instead of grouping by dates, you want to group by number. Now, let's go look at our data set here. Let's say I want to add, count all of the sales between 0 and 500, 500 and 1,000. Well, we can do that, not grouping by a date, but grouping by some other number. I'm going to click in a single cell. Actually, I'm going to notice over here, I'm going to double click and call this date pivot. Enter. All right, so I'm going to come back over here, and we want to group by uh, number. Now, there's two types of grouping by number situation. There's a situation where you have integers. And if you look through this entire sales column, they've all been rounded. they are only integers. There's no decimals, whereas the cost of goods sold has some decimals. So when you group by numbers, you got to just keep in mind, are they all integers or are there some decimals? Now, it doesn't matter that much, but the way the label that's created by the pivot table engine is different, whether it's an integer or it has a decimal. All right, let's click in any single cell and do Alt-NVT, Enter. There's a new sheet. Now I'm going to drag Sales to the row labels. All right now I'm going to come over here and right click Group. It'll instantly give me the min and the max. So I'm going to start at 0. I'm going to end at 2,000. And I'm going to increment by 500. When I click OK, instantly it gives me a label. Now notice the label, because it's an integer with no decimals, 0 to 499. 500 to 999. So there is no repeat. This doesn't say 0 to 500, then 500 to 1,000, right? So integers have cleaner labels. The, the labels are not ambiguous. We know exactly which number goes in which category. Now, this, uh, if I drag any one of these, sales, for example, or any one of these other ones, it's going to count. Now I'm going to drag the sales back up here. Drag, oops, drag the sales back up there and uh, put region. In every case, we're going to get the same count, because what it's doing is it's counting the transactions. All right, I'm going to format this, design, show in tabular. And I'm going to leave that right here. And now we're going to do a second pivot table. And this one we'll do on the same sheet, and then compare and contrast. All right, I'm going to go back to my data set. Alt NVT, and instead of Enter, I'm going to click on Existing, click on this location here, click on Sheet 115. We need to change the name of that. And I'm going to click right, right uh, a couple to the, the right of that, and click OK. Now I'm going to drag the cost of goods sold down to the row labels, right click Group, Start at, and I'm going to say 0 all the way up to 1,000. And I'm going to uh, group. The increment will be 100. And click OK. Notice the difference in the labels. 0 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 300. Now, the trick is, is that it, it, well, I mean, the problem is it could be ambiguous. Where does 100 fit? Does it hit there or there? Well, pivot tables will always include the upper value but not the lower value. So for this category right here, exactly 100 doesn't fit here. It fits here. It's always the upper number that is included in the, in the category. The lower number is not. If you know how to use the frequency function, uh, that works the same way as a pivot table. Now I can simply drag any. Again, I drag sales there. I get a count of 80 from 0 to 100. If I drag any other one, 
I get uh, the same count. So that is a, a useful type of pivot table when you want to group by a particular number and then count. Now let's make a chart. And we're going to talk about charts later in this uh, video. But let's just see how amazingly easy it is. And the fact that the chart is a type of pivot table, too. It's, it's actually a pivot chart. I'm just going to click on the charting button. You could just as easily go over to Insert and click on any one of those. I'm going to click on Pivot Chart. It looks just like the um, regular Insert Chart. I'm going to click Column and click OK. It puts the chart right on this sheet. And it actually has uh, some ability for filtering, uh, just like it would in, in uh, the pivot table. It puts the labels here, the column heights there. You can clean this up. I'm going to click um, Delete. I'm going to click de Delete Count of product. All right, um, and whatever you do, if we were to drag region to the report filter, instantly the, the pivot table updates, but so does the chart. If you go ahead and select East and click OK, instantly the pivot table and the chart update. They are linked. All right, so we grouped by date, we grouped by integer, we grouped by decimal, we even saw with one click that you can create a chart linked to the pivot table. Now I'm going to call this um, group number pivot. Enter. Now we want to go back and talk, go back to our uh, pivot table data sheet. Click on PT data. Now we want to create a new pivot table on a new sheet. We want to look at some different calculations possible with the pivot table. I'm going to click in a single cell, Alt, NVT, Enter. Now I want to create a basic pivot table and show you how to copy it a bunch of times and then change the calculations. Let's go ahead and use date. We have our dates already grouped. And then I'm going to say sales, drag it to values. Now I'm going to do a little formatting. Let's see, right click, value field settings, number. I'm going to show currency. These, this is the sales column, zero decimals. Click OK. Click OK. Two OKs there. We definitely don't like that row labels there. So I'm going to go to design and show in tabular form. All right, I'm going to change this to sum. Right click, summarize value by, and sum. All right, now we have this table here. I'm going to highlight this. Control-C, click Control-C, and then I'm going to come over here and Control-C. All right, so let's look at some of the different calculating capabilities. Now I'm going to turn those dancing ants off with Escape. The first one is Running Total. I'm going to right click, Show Values As, a bunch of amazing calculations. Let's look at Running Total in. This is great. It asks us upon which field. Well, we want a running total through the month. So it's the date field. Click OK. And just like that, it shows you the accumulation of total sales through each month. There's the total at the end of all the months. Now I'm going to copy this, Control-C, Control-V. Actually, we want to put a, I'm just going to put running T. Here I want to change it to percent of running total. Right click. Show values as and percent running total in based on the date. All right, so it shows us our percentage uh, moving forward. Now let's change this also to uh, percent running t. Uh, you could put a better label there. Now let's look at our next example. I want to add another field. So I'm going to take the region and drop it down to column. And what I'd like to do is create percentages. So I want all of these numbers as a percentage of the grand total. Then I want to see how to do each individual January amount based on these conditions up here, region, as a percentage of the total for January. And then we'll do the same thing for the column, percentage of each of the East numbers for each month as a percentage of the total East three different calculations. So I'm simply going to right click, summarize, show values as, and we have percentage of grand total. Again, that will be the percentage of that number there. Instantly, percentage of grand total. You can always tell the base because it will be uh, shown as 100%. 
How about right click, show values as, percentage of column total. Each individual element as a percentage of the column total. And then there's percentage of row total. Absolutely amazing. I'm glad there's a pivot table to make all these calculations a lot harder to do with a formula. Now let's look at difference from. Oftentimes in accounting, you want to see the difference from month to month as a, as a number or a percentage. Right click, show values as, and difference from. Now it'll ask us what's the base the date, and it will ask the base item. Now for us, I want to see the difference of each one of these items as compared to just January. So we'll start with this one, and you click OK. Each one of these is the difference, April compared to January, May compared to January. Right click, show values as, difference from again, but this time let's do previous. And now it shows us moving forward. The difference between February and January was down about 30,000. The difference between February and March was about up 9,600. Finally, you could do this as a percentage also. Show values as, percentage difference from. I'm going to say date and then the base item. Let's do previous. And there we go. So for each month, we are down from January to February, down by 17%. February to March, up by about 7%. So all sorts of amazing show values as. Now, one last calculating table. I'm going to copy, uh, no, I'm just going to create a new pivot table and put it on that sheet, Alt-NVT. I'm going to say existing sheet. Click in this location. Click back on, uh-oh, forgot to name it. I'm going to click right here. Now you've got to be careful. If you put it right here, then the, it'll interfere with this pivot table because it needs room for that report filter. So I'm going to click a few below. This is dangerous because if you ever pivot this one up here and it starts to throw lots of data uh, below, it'll give you a warning, but it'll say, you know, do you want me to destroy the data below? So you've got to be careful when putting multiple pivot tables on the same sheet. All right. Let's just do a simple one, region. But watch this. I want the average, the sum, and the count. So I'm going to drag sales 1, 2, and 3. Actually, we'll keep. So each one of these is count by default. So I'm going to right click, summarize value by, that will be sum. Right click, summarize value by, that'll be average. Right click, summarize value by. Instead of count, I'm going to show max. And there we have it. Now we could clean this up with some uh, labels and some formatting. The bummer is, is that you can't format the whole, all the values at once. You have to do it one, two, three times, open up that uh, number dialog box. All right, I'm going to call this pivot count. All right, now a couple last things we want to see about pivot tables. Now, notice we've already grouped by month. So if I Alt NVT Enter and drag the date, it is going to be grouped. The reason why is 2007, 2010, there's a single what's called cache. So the original data is stored in a single cache in memory. So it remembers that there. Um, the date has been grouped. If you ungroup it here, it'll ungroup it on all the other sheets. So I'm going to right click, cl uh, delete that sheet. We can go back to the old three step wizard. Now, in earlier versions, 2003 and before, when you built individual pivot tables, it would create a new cache. The reason why they changed it is because it takes up a lot of memory, right? So if we want to create a new pivot table that and not have the dates group, we have to invoke that old pivot table three-step wizard. Now you can add a button to the quat, or you could use the keyboard Alt D P. That's D for data menu, P for pivot table. So ready? Alt D P. And there it is, the old three-step wizard. All right, so we have Excel list pivot table. I'm going to click next. 
That's the data set. I'm going to click Next. If you click Yes, you will save memory. If you click No, two reports will be the two reports will be separate. That's what I want. I'm going to click No. On a new sheet, click Finish. Now when I drag the date down here, yes. Now I can do whatever I want. I could put the sales over here. There I have a daily sales uh, summary. I'm going to say New Cash. Now I'm going to go back to the pivot table data set. And we want to see how to do two last things. If you have a empty cell in a number column, you can still do pivots, but watch what happens. Alt NVT, Enter. If I drag the date down here, notice now it's grouped because I'm working off of the 2007-2010 uh, cache. If I drag sales down here, it should be sum because a number should default to sum. But when you have spaces in your number category, it defaults to count. Now it's easy enough to change. You right click and change it to sum. A more troubling problem, I'm actually going to empty in number. Let's go back to our data set. The more troubling problem is if you have a empty cell in your date column. Now, I'm not going to do this, but if you open this up as a new pivot table and try to group, you will get a message that says you cannot group. Further, if you have dates entered as text, so this would be 6 slash 19 slash 13, right? It may you know look similar, but that's text. Empty cells or text in your date column, you cannot group as month. So anytime you get the message, cannot group this field and its dates, almost certainly it's empty cells or dates entered as text. All right, that was a lot of stuff about pivot tables. Now our next topic is recorded macros. Now we're going to click on the sheet M11. Now what is a macro? Macro means that you're typing out code. You can actually not use the features in Excel, but type out code and get Excel to execute some command. Now, I'm not a code writer, but luckily for those of us that are not code writers, and actually the code inside of Excel is called VBA. It's Visual Basic Application. For those of us that don't know how to write out that code, luckily there is a macro recorder. And here's what it, how it can benefit us. Say we have a report like this, and we get it each month. It's got different numbers. But we do the same formatting, the same uh, add an extra column with a formula. If there's a repetitive task, we can actually turn on the macro recorder. And as we do things like open up format cells, add a formula, and copy it down, it will write the code for us. Now. If you really want to automate things, you need to learn how to write VBA code because the macro recorded recorder is very limited. But we'll see a couple good uses for the macro recorder. Now, there's a couple things we have to do first. First thing is you have to show the developer ribbon. So right click, customize ribbon, and then over in the left you can check developer. Number two is you can't have the file extension .xls X. So I'm actually going to save as and change it to .xlsm. So I'm going to hit F12. That's a keyboard shortcut for save as. Notice down here it says uh, XLSX, Excel Workbook, but we want to click on this and use the M, .xlsm. The M obviously means macro, Excel Macro Enabled Workbook. And then we can click Save. So now that we've converted this to a .xlsm and we've showed the developer ribbon, we can go ahead and talk about recording a macro. Let's first take a look at the developer ribbon. Over here in the code section, record macro. We'll click that when we want to record. This use relative reference. This is very important. Um, if, we, if it's not yellow orange. That means when we record our macro and we click in a cell, that means that it clicked in B2. If I select this range, it will select exactly B2 to B11. If we use relative reference, then 
if our cursor's here and we click in D3, it doesn't really click in D3. It's recording a relative movement, meaning wherever the active cell was, it goes one, two to the right, or adds two column. If I were here and relative was on, it would go one, two. We will use that in uh, the next example. Here, we're going to keep it absolute. This report, we get it. It's the same size. It's always in the same set of cells from A1 to C11. So we can use absolute. Macro security, if we click here, you get to choose your security level. In general, you want to disable all macros with notification. That means you get a little yellow button that says, do you want to enable macros? Uh, there's disable macros except for digitally sign, disable all macros. If you're only working with your own stuff and nobody else's um, workbooks, maybe you want to select this one, enable all macros. But in general, this is uh, the one to select. I'm going to click OK. This is our list of macros. Notice there's a keyboard shortcut there, Alt F8. There's also the Visual Basic Editor. We'll see that later. That's Alt F11. All right. Now, we're going to record a, an absolute macro. So it actually doesn't matter where our cursor starts. Again, our report is always going to be in the same set of cells. Now, we're going to turn the macro recorder on, do what we want to this report, and then we'll test it on these other sheets to see if it can automate the process. All right, you ready? I'm going to click Record Macro. Now, very importantly, we want to give it a good name. I put Format Static Report because it will always be in the same range. You can assign a keyboard, which is kind of cool. We're not going to do that for this one. You can store your macro in this workbook or in your personal workbook. For this first one, I'm going to save it in the personal workbook. That means store it in personal macro workbook. It is available universally to you on this computer. Now, personal macro workbook is a hidden workbook on this particular computer. And we'll look at where it's hidden and how to open it after we record our macro. Now we want to create a description. All right, so we give it some sort of description. Now, when I click OK, anything we do, including mistakes, is recorded in the macro. All right, I'm going to click OK. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select A1 to D1 or D11. And I'm going to go up to the Home and select All Borders. Now I'm going to click in highlight the range B2 to C11, Control-1, and add some sort of formatting like number with a comma, <clears throat> zero decimals. Click OK. This is all being recorded by this macro. Then I'm going to add a new column, Change. And then I'm going to add a formula, equals one cell to my left minus two cells to my left. Control Enter. And then I'm going to copy it down. All right, when I copy that down, it copied from the it copied to the range D2 to D11. Now this will only work because our report is always the same number of rows. In our next macro, we'll see a way to trick the macro recorder using relative references. All right, so I've I, added all my formatting. I want to end the cursor. I want it always to be in A1, so I'm going to end in A1. Now, I can turn the macro recorder off right here. It says Stop Recording, or there's a button down in the status bar. I'm going to click Stop. Now, let's go look at what uh, got recorded. Now, we could use Macros, Alt F8, or even Visual Basic, Alt F11. But I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut Alt F8. And I have a bunch of macros here. The one we just recorded is right here, XLSB Format Static Report in the Personal. Now, that's a hidden workbook. If I click Run, it will work because it can run from the hidden workbook. But what I really want to do is I want to go look at the code. I want to click Edit. If I click Edit, it's polite. It says, hey, this is a hidden workbook. You have to go unhide it first. So I'm going to click Escape. Escape, and lo and behold, on the View tab, we can go over to Hide and Unhide. Yes, <laughs> this is Hide and Unhide for a workbook. So I'm going to click Unhide, and all the hidden workbooks will show up. I'm going to unhide this, click OK. 
Here's that personal.xlsb. Now I can Alt F8. And I'm going to select my Format Static Report. Notice it just shows the name of the macro because I'm actually in that workbook. I'm going to click Edit. Wow, look at that. Let's see if I can get this Whoops, down on the screen. This is the VBA editor. We have uh, our VBA project view here. There's the workbook. The workbook we're working in is over here. I can open this up if I had uh, uh, macros in, in this one. We will later. There's all the sheets. I'm going to go ahead and close that. Over here, this is the personal. What just happened is we inserted modules. Now, I already had one in there, so I'm, this module 2, the code shows up over here. Let's just look at this code. Range select A1 to D11.select. Now, that is an absolute reference. That means no matter, whenever you run this, it's always going to select A1 to D11. And then there's a bunch of code. Notice the macro recorder didn't record record efficient code. It recorded all sorts of things just to do that border. And then um, select the range B2 to C11. It added the number format. It added this formula. The cell references are in a completely different uh, form than you're used to. It's not the A1, uh, B1 form. Down here, we have a fill destination. Again, it's hard coded in, so that formula got hard coded in. We'll see how to trick that instead of using range. Uh, we'll do something else. And then the last little bit, range a one suck. So that's the code that got recorded. Now I'm going to close this. This is a separate window, um, separate from the Excel window. We just went and looked at it, right? Now I'm going to go ahead and hide this again. All right, now we're back here. Now let's go test it. I'm going to click over here. Remember, it doesn't matter where our cursor starts. Um, sometimes it does matter, and we'll see an example of that later. Alt F8. I'm going to click on my personal format static report and click Run. you got to be kidding me. Look at that. Is that totally beautiful? I'm going to come over here. Now I want to Alt F8. If you ever wanted to create a keyboard, you could come here to Options and assign. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, this one here. Click, click on Options, and you could assign a keyboard. There's the information we entered in at the beginning. All right, um, and then we could run it one more time, but I'm not going to bother. We're going to go over this next sheet, M14. Now, here's the situation, M14, M15, M16. We're getting completely different heights to our report. So now we're going to have to use uh, relative reference. We can actually switch back and forth between relative and absolute references while we're recording our macro. All right. Now, we're going to start with absolute because the very first move is going to be select A1. And then we're going to do a special keyboard shortcut that highlights the current range. See, if we went like this during our uh, macro, it would highlight A1 to C5. But if you use the keyboard shortcut Control asterisk, and I'm going to use the asterisk on the number pad. Or if you're going to use the asterisk on the number 8, use Control Shift 8. Control asterisk, the, the difference, because notice Control A does that too. Control A is a completely different line of code than Control asterisk. And Control asterisk is what will get us to highlight a whole, uh, the whole range no matter how tall it is. Control asterisk, I'm doing that on each one. All right, and then we're going to have to um, be tricky. When we create our label, we can do um, an absolute reference. Even when we create our formula and enter, we can um, enter it into D2 because it will always be a, a formula in D2. But when we go to copy it down, we're going to have to trick it. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to absolutely click 1 over, and then we're going to use the keyboard shortcut Control Down Arrow. Now, Control Down Arrow didn't select C5. It went to the bottom of the current region. And then we're going to click Relative Reference. So when I click here, it's not clicking D5. It's going Offset. Please go from the active cell and add one column. Then we will 
um, control shift up arrow, which is another trick that doesn't highlight the range. It, it highlights a relative range, and we'll paste the formula. All right, so we're, the idea here is we're going to use relative and absolute references to get a variable height report to get to format it. All right, you ready? We're going to go ahead and record our macro. This is going to be format report variable height. I am going to assign a keyboard just to show you how that works. I'm going to hold Shift and then F. So it will be Control Shift F. And I'm saving this in this workbook. Now, of course, you might want to save this in uh, your personal if you're going to use this all the time. And then we're going to write a description. All right, so we added a description there. All right, when we click OK, it's going to record even if we make a mistake. All right, here we go. Click OK. Now, I'm absolutely, I'm actually not going to click in A1. I'm going to start here and create uh, the formula first. So I'm absolutely going to click in D1. I'm going to type x. The formula is going to say range, select range uh, D1 and put this the text change in it. Enter. Now I'm going to do my formula. Equals one cell to my left minus two cells to my left. When I Control Enter, it puts the formula in D2. But now watch this. I'm going to copy it when I select. C2, it's recording absolutely, but now I'm going to trick it. I'm going to go Control Down Arrow. That says go down to the bottom of the current range. Now, because this could be in any different cell in, in this column C, I'm going to switch over to Relative References. Now, when I click in D5, it's not really D5. It said please offset from the active cell and add one column. Now, watch this. I'm going to use Control Shift Up Arrow and then Control V. I'm going to hit Escape to turn off the dancing ants. Now I'm absolutely going to click in, so I'm going to turn this off, and I'm going to click in B2. And watch this. I want to format this whole text here. So again, I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut to trick it. Control Shift Arrow will go however far over until it hits an empty cell, and then Control Shift Down Arrow. That goes down as far it needs to until it runs into an empty row. And now I'm going to Control 1, uh, number formatting, number, separator, zero decimals, and then click OK. What I want to do now is um, add the borders. And we're going to use that keyboard shortcut. And this is actually the active cell. So we're going to use Control Asterisk. Then we're going to add our borders. And if we're still in absolute mode, so right here, I'm going to click in cell A1 or wherever I want it. Maybe I wanted it over here, always in uh, two columns over. So I'm going to click there. Now I'm ready to stop. So I'm going to click on this button here or this one up here. All right, here's the moment of truth. Let's go over. And even before we look at the code, let's see if this works. I'm going to click on this sheet. And our keyboard shortcut was Control Shift F. You've got to be kidding me. Look at that. Amazing. Let's try it here. Control Shift F. Oh, it even did a big column. Look at that. Now let's go look at the code. Alt F8. I'm going to find my format variable height and click Edit. If you wanted to look what the options were, you could see, or you forget the keyboard shortcut, you look there. I'm going to click Edit. Now it brings me right to the module. Notice that this module has been inserted inside. This is a big workbook inside this workbook right here. That's our workbook. All right, so there's the module. And the first part was absolute, so range uh, d1.select. Even this one, there's our formula. We copied it. We selected C2. Now look at this, selection.endown.select. That's go to the bottom of the current region. And there it is, the active cell dot offset. Row comes first, then column. It added one column. Now this little bit of code here comes from the macro recorder. It doesn't really mean anything. We went over, and then we did our keyboard selection.endup.x and pasted. it. Absolutely amazing. Then we uh, selected B2, absolutely. That's where we turned the absolute reference back on. And we did our range.selection, range.selection, this XL to the right, XL down. That's when we control shift arrow. 
absolutely amazing. That's a way of tricking the macro into a variable height. And even at the end, we selected absolutely F1. I'm going to close this right here. So very important concept, being able to use relative reference and absolute. Now we have, there's some notes right here. But we want to look at one more macro. Now, this macro isn't formatting reports. But it is going to take advantage of knowing how to use relative reference. Here we get a data set, and the record is set up vertically. And we need to have it in a proper data set. So we got this data dump, and all we did is we added the field names up here. Now, let's step through what we're going to do And when you're recording a macro, especially if you're learning for the first time. Actually, when you're learning for the first time, the most important thing is you record your macro, it, you, get an, you run it, you get an arrow, error, Alt F8, and then delete. I did that so many times over the years I learned. Delete it and start over. That's also why I had a number of sheets for us here. So when you get this workbook, you can tr practice, because you may try it the first time and mess up. Always copy your data before you run a macro on it, right? All right, so the idea here is we need to um, copy this. And this macro is going to require that we start the macro in the first cell in the record we want to copy and transpose, right? So we can use, with that cell selected, Control-Shift-Down arrow, Control-C. Now, this is the active cell. Before I do anything, I want to turn on relative reference. Remember, then from this cell, it's going to offset 1. Because right now, it'll go from in A2. But later, when we have lots of records, it's going to be in A3, A4, A5. So then I click there. I'll do something like uh, right click, transpose. Now the active cell is still there. I offset and add one row. I'm going to highlight all the way down. So the code will say, highlight the entire row, offset this many, right click, delete. And then I'm going to end the macro by selecting the first item. That way we can run the macro over and over, and it will always uh, transpose the record correctly. So I'm going to Control Z, Control Z, Escape. All right, let's try this. We're going to start this with the Use Relative Reference on. We're not even going to use the Absolute uh, button here. So the whole way through, it will be relative. All right, Record Macro, Transpose Records. I'm going to definitely add a keyboard shortcut, Shift-G. I'm going to save it in this workbook. This is a one-time macro. I'm going to add a description. All right, there's our description. All right, when I click OK, this thing is running. All right, you ready? Control-Shift. Down arrow, Control C. Now notice, active cell is right there. The relative is turned on. So when I um, take my mouse and select, or simply do up arrow, it at, it did offset minus one row. Now I'm instead of pasting, I'm going to right click, paste, tr special transpose. The active cell is right there. I'm going to then. When I click on number 3, it says Offset Add One Row. And I'm going to go all the way down to row 11. Right click Delete. I'm going to make sure there's the active cell to offset and add one more row. And now I'm going to turn off the macro. Stop recording. Now watch this. Let's try our keyboard, Control-Shift-G. Control-Shift-G, Control-Shift-G. Boom, 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 boom. Absolutely amazing. Now let's try it over here, Control-Shift-G. Boop. Why did that happen? Because the correct cell was not selected. I'm not going to click Debug. I'm going to click End, Escape. That's why you copy the data set. Oh, that was scary. Now I'm going to go over that. That one is wrecked. Now I'm going to click here, click in the correct cell before starting my macro, and then Control-Shift-G, G, 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 G. Wow, that is amazing. All right. Um, that was just a little bit about recorded macros. The main idea is that we learned for us non-code writers that we can do um, basic ta repetitive task, record a macro, and then it's easy to do that repetitive task. And we saw how to use absolute and relative. Those are the movements of your selection cursor. All right, now we want to talk about our last topic. We're going to go over to the chart 
types sheet. Click on chart types. Now we want to talk about charts. We're going to start off by looking at the different chart types. Now up here we have a data set. And look at this. It's already summarized. So oftentimes, you either with formulas or pivot tables, you create your data set. Now there's lots of different data sets. Here's a common one, uh, row headers, column headers. Now we take this data. When do we use a pie chart? It's very simple. When we're comparing the parts to the whole, or we want percentages. In this case, we have kites, toys, and boomerangs. So we have these numbers here. These are the, the labels or categories. And here are the numbers. Broop, we highlight. Those are the parts. They make up the whole. That's when you use a pie chart. Chart junk. That is a phrase made famous by Edward Tufte. He wrote a bunch of books on charting. This is just chart junk. Why Excel even has the exploded pie as an option is beyond me. First off, the most a critical thing about this is anytime you have a pie chart, there are percentages. And when you tilt it on its side, you distort the percentages. This formatting is ridiculous. We also have unnecessary repetition. You would not believe how many charts you will see out there, even in board meetings. Boomerangs, boomerangs. You don't need it twice. All right, uh, chart junk. We don't want chart junk. Column charts, very simple. We have some categories along the horizontal axis, and we have columns. Columns are vertical. There are numbers on the vertical axis. The height of each column tells us what that particular number is. We're comparing across categories. Now we have a legend up here that tells us blue is toys, orange is boomerangs, and gray is kite. A bar chart, and oftentimes column and bar uh, the terms column and bar are used interchangeably, but they're not. Columns are vertical in Excel. Bars are horizontal. Now, the only difference between these two charts is that bars sitting horizontally sometimes emphasize the differences more effectively than a column chart. Here is a stacked column. And it is great because what it did is it took these three different bars. Notice this is about 10,000. This is about 4,000. And this is a little bit extra here. It just added them all and showed them proportionally as a total. So this is exactly about 14 something. So each one of these shows the three categories, but also visually shows the total in that March is much bigger than February or January line charts and XY scatters. One of the biggest mistakes in Excel, line charts, XY scatter. What you want to remember is that lines represent a single number. XY scatters have two numbers. Now here's what I mean. All line charts have categories equidistant along the horizontal axis. And then the up and down of the line is the number on the vertical axis. There's only one number. Even when we have years along here, and we'll see this example later, they're equal distance. One number for line charts. XY scatter for any one of these particular dots, out a certain distance, up a certain distance. So this is a XY scatter. Our studied for a test probably uh, can predict the final score on some sort of test. The more hours, the higher the score on the test. Again, it's a certain distance along the horizontal or x-axis, and then a certain distance up or down along the vertical or y-axis. Two numbers. Finally, we can have some variation. This is a column chart, but the bars are touching because the categories extend from 40 to 49, then 50 to 51. So there's nothing in between. So we visually portray that with a no gap. All right, now let's go look at some examples. We'll click on the sheet column. All right, we're going to start our set of examples of how to create charts by looking at a column chart. Now here's a cross tabulated table. Usually these are created with pivot tables or formulas. And this the column chart is particularly well suited for this cross tabulation. Now let's highlight this, not the totals. We don't need the totals, just the column headers and the row headers. And now. Let's go to Insert, Column, and then I'm going to do the column. By the way, we talked about chart junk. Are cones and pyramids chart junk? You bet they are. There's no real good reason to be articulating the height of a particular item with a cone or a pyramid. 
it's chart junk. Well, except for if you're a cone factory or a pyramid factory, then it would be perfect. All right, I'm going to use this column, but I'm going to teach you a keyboard shortcut. So I click Escape. The keyboard for a column chart on this sheet is Alt F1. The keyboard for a chart on a new sheet is F11. Now, it's really the default chart, not a column chart. It just happens that most computers have column as their default. Now, on the next example, I'll show you how to change that default. All right, you ready? I'm going to do Alt F1. Beautiful, just like that. It comes out actually kind of nice. Now, let's talk about this. How did the charting engine decide to put the months on the horizontal axis as categories and the row headers at in the legend. It goes like this. If the number of column headers are equal to or greater than row headers, it will show up just like this. Column headers, horizontal axis. Now, if I'm down here, if the column headers are less than the row headers, then it will be the reverse. I'm going to Alt F1. And we could see here, it chose the row headers to go on the horizontal axis. All right, I'm going to scoot this over to the side. We're going to talk about this one. Another important aspect, and I actually have some notes up here. It, when you get to advanced charting, you really got to dissect and know what uh, Excel names all the numbers. Now, up here, because it took the row headers, I'm just have, took this data and put it over here, it took the row headers and put them in the legend, that means these numbers will be called toys, these numbers will be called boomerangs, these numbers will be called kites. There's some notes right there. Let's explicitly look inside the chart. And again, for some advanced charts, this is the real trick. We're going to go to the design and select data. This is the power because you can do what? You can edit any particular series of numbers you want. You can add, you can remove, you can also edit the categories on the horizontal axis. Now, let's just click on one. It has toys. I'm going to click Edit. And sure enough, it took the name, boom, toys, and here are what are called the series values. Again, the reason this is important because for some charts, when you highlight the data, it just comes out all wrong. But no problem. You have the power to edit, add, remove, and edit the labels. I'm going to click Escape. All right, now I'd like to scroll down and look at the same example, but we're going to format the chart. I'm going to highlight this. And hey, this time, just to show you, I didn't show you. Let's do F11. Notice it puts it as a new sheet. I'm going to call this column chart one. Now I just I forgot to show you that, so that's kind of cool. If you're going to print it out on 8 by 11, it prints out perfectly on a page. But now I'm going to go back here and do the keyboard Alt F1. Now, let's improve this chart. It would be nice to see a chart title at the top. So we're going to go to the Layout Chart Ribbon. And this group is very important labels. There's all sorts of great things we can do. I'm going to go to Chart Title above chart. Now by default when it comes out, it says chart title and notice it's got a solid line. Check this out. You can just start typing. So I'm going to type summer sales. What? Wait a second. I started typing. Where did it go? It's up in the formula bar. Hit enter and there it goes. Now, it would also be nice or let me show you one thing before I show you how to link the labels to the cells. A lot of times people come in here and highlight and type. That's fine too. That dashed line will say, hey, you're editing in it live. So I could um, type something like into the wind. And then there you go. But let's look at one advantage. If you have the chart title as a solid line, you could come up to the formula bar. If there's text you highlight, a lot oftentimes there's no text, I'm going to highlight this and type an equal sign. Whoa, wait a sec. That means I can link this with a formula to the cell. So I'm going to click on A28 and Enter. Now it's linked. Now let's look at this. Everything is linked. I'm going to change this to 1900. Notice the bar shot up, but also the 
axis change. I'm going to Control Z. If I were to change all of this formatting, Control Shift tilde to go back to general, look what happens to these numbers. Control Z, now there actually is a setting where you can either link or delink the, the number formatting to the chart. I'm going to click on the axis. And when selecting elements, sometimes it can be tricky. One way to avoid the trickiness is to go up to the Layout, over to Current Selection. And there's a whole list of all the elements. And you could select whatever you want this way. It's got uh, vertical axis. Now, when you select an item, you can format it. And there's a few dialog boxes you have to uh, wade through. But the majority of all of the elements allow you to use the keyboard shortcut Control-1 to format. Now I'm going to Control-1, and there I get the Format Axis dialog box. Now remember, Control-1 is Format Cell. So that keyboard works in the cells and in the charts. Now I'm going to go over to Number, and there it is. That little uh, text box there allows you to either link or not link to the source data. Because you can come here and do all sorts of wild things. I'm going to click Close. All right, um, let's click on the legend, Control-1. And you can move the legend. Move it to the top, move it to the bottom. Into the Wind Sales. So we'll assume that from this title, we can understand that these are sales. Uh, these are sales in dollars. With month names, you really don't need a label down there. If it's ambiguous what they are, then you can add a axis title. And we'll do that in later videos. All right, let's go to our next example. I want to go, actually, one more thing here. You know, I kind of think this is busy. Then what's the keyboard for delete? Delete. All right, uh, let's go to our next example. I'm going to scroll over a little bit here, templates and default. Now here I've created a black and white chart. It's a pie chart. Let's say I do this all the time. And not only would I like to save it as a template, so when I go up to Insert Chart, it's just sitting there as an option, but I'd like to set it as the default. So once we have a chart we'd like to save as a template, it's very easy. We go up to Design, Save as Template. When we click on this button, a Save As dialog box comes up. Here's the pathway to the default chart folder. And look at this, chart.crtx. Now I'm going to call this something more useful than chart. How about bwpy? So then I'm going to click. And it's being saved in the uh, templates folder when I click Save. Now watch this. When I highlight this and go up to Insert, well, wait a second, I don't see it there. No problem. I can click any one of these, but this will get me to the dialog box. And there it is. Up at the top, there's templates. Now I have two of them. One is chart one, and here's the one I want, black and white pie. So now I have this as an option. When I click this and click OK, there we have selected it. Now let's set this as the default chart. That means our keyboards will work to create this black and white pie. I'm going to go up to Insert, click on the Charts dialog launcher. I'm going to go up to Templates. I'm going to select the one I want, and there it is. By the way, in this version, it's a lot easier. Some of the earlier versions of Excel it was a little bit more complicated to set a chart as default. So now I'm going to click that, boop, boop, click OK. And now watch this. I'm going to highlight this and use Alt F1. No way. Saving as a template, setting as default, really useful tricks if you're using a lot of charts. Now let's go over to the sheet, Copy. I'm going to click. And we have a chart here. We want to copy this chart and then change the chart type. So we want one column, but we also want some other type of chart. No problem. Don't click in the inside, because then it will copy just that particular element. Click on the outside edge. And then our keyboard's Control-C. Click in a cell. Control-V will work. Now columns show differences across categories. Let's change it to a bar. I'm going to remove those lines, delete. Right click over in the white. If you right click here, this is a great mistake I should show you. If you accidentally right click the columns and say Change Series Chart Type, it'll change just that one series. 
And if I change this one to, say, a bar, you've got to be kidding me. It can do two at once, but that's not what we want. Control Z, you got to uh, right click. And when you see change chart type, you know you're on the right path. Now I can simply change it to a bar and click OK. What is going on here? A couple ways we could deal with crowded numbers. We could expand the uh, size of the chart. When you see your horizontal white arrow, you could do that, Control Z. You could click on this axis, Control 1, and change it to some other format, currency. In fact, we could do something tricky. These are in thousands. We could come down here to Custom, and right here, we can put pound and comma. Comma says remove three zeros or a thousand, and then put space K. Now, in order to put text into number formatting, you usually have to put it in double quotes. But K is the one thing that number formatting understands. I'm going to click Add. There it is. I'm going to click Close. And no way. There's a K. Whoa, wait a second. We don't want that. Control-1. I'm going to change that so the custom number formatting should have three sections, one for positive, one for negative, one for um, zero. Semicolon separates the sections. Then I'm going to put minus pound comma space K, semicolon, and then a zero. Right, So that'll show up properly on our chart. Notice it doesn't say link to source data. I'm overwriting that. I'm going to click Add and then Close. And so now I fixed it. Lots of ways to fix that. We could have removed the decimals, removed the dollar sign. All right, now let's copy this whole chart, Control-C, and we want to look at a stacked bar. So I'm going to right click, change chart type. It's over on bar, but now I'm going to use this one. The difference between these two we'll look at. I like this stacked bar because it retains the actual height, which then you can compare the totals for the categories listed on the vertical axis. So right here, we can clearly compare March, February, and January. And then within each, we have our legend items. Now I'm going to copy this, Control-C, Control-V. And now what if I change this? I basically never use this chart. I always think it's a little bit confusing, but sometimes there's a good uh, use for it. I'm going to select that. Notice it's 100% stack, stack bar. And it changes the axis here completely, indicating that these are no longer numbers. These are percentages. But sometimes it gets confusing because then it looks like they're all the same. You know, The power of a chart is that it's visually articulating the numbers in a way where you can quickly understand. And, and this has the potential, especially if you're not looking down here, to say, oh, look, they're all the same. All right, now, those were some different bar charts. We saw how to copy. Let's go over to line. I'm going to click on the line. Now, line charts are important. We have some categories, one, two, three, listed on the as row labels, and the years listed along the column header. So I'm going to highlight this whole range here and go up to Insert Line. Lines will show us one number on the vertical axis. So I'm going to select and what? It totally misinterpreted what I want. It put years here. This is where you have to know how to go back to design, select data. This is the real power of knowing how to make charts. I'm simply going to come down to product and year. That's the blue one right there. And delete or remove. Now I'm going to click Edit because it went by some default, one, two, three. And now I'm allowed to highlight my years. So I've restructured my chart. Click OK. Knowing how to uh, edit the series, the actual numbers, edit or delete or remove, and the categories, the horizontal axis, very important. I'm going to click OK. We have our three lines that we can compare over time. Again, there's only one number here. These were equidistance. Now, we probably want to add a title to this. I'm going to go to Layout, Chart Title, Above Chart. And I'm going to just type. I want to say Sales by Year. 
notice I started typing because it was a solid line. It appeared up here. When I hit enter, boom. And that'll cover it. We don't need to put anything here because that'll tell us that the sales, we can figure out this is a year. Maybe we want to move this. I'm just going to Control-1, see what it looks like at the bottom. OK, I kind of like that there. All right, let's move this over to the side. Now notice what happened. We had some text there. If you don't have any text right here, which sometimes is OK and sometimes is not, Watch what happens if I go up and do my insert line, select this one. So it was that text there that caused the line chart to misinterpret it. Now let's go over to this next sheet, number formatting. We've already talked about this a little bit, but I want to show you here. And I can already see there's going to be a problem. If I go up, we have our years here. And this is a typical data set, field names, right? So we have our year here, when we insert a line chart, we're going to get that same problem. We could fix it, but it would be just as easy to delete it. And now when we highlight the same data set and go up to line, it will interpret it correctly. Now, I'd like to do something with this axis here. We talked about, whoops, now I tried to move the chart, and I accidentally selected highlighted range finder color-coded range. I'm going to Control-Z. Luckily, there's an undo. Now I'm going to try and point over here. Now what I'd like to do is format this in the cells. We saw this earlier. Here is that code. I'm going to Control-1 and actually in the Format Cells dialog box for the sales, I'm going to say pound, comma, space K, semicolon, minus pound space K and semicolon 0. Again, I if I don't put a 0, even though we don't have any zeros here, then the chart will show something funny. So I put that there. This is custom number formatting the cells. I'm going to click OK. And sure enough, it shows it's sucking it from the cells. And we could further improve this by adding a title. I'm not going to. Just in case uh, you're interested, pound, comma, comma. Each one of those comma removes three zeros or a 1,000. This would be how you'd have to uh, show um, 1 million as 1M. Notice because it's not a K, we had to put it in double quotes. All right, now let's go talk about XY scatter. Click on XY. Before we talk about XY scatter, let's review. Line chart, one number. XY scatter, two numbers. A line chart, one number up and down vertical axis, and then there's equidistance categories along the horizontal axis. Line charts are great for showing trends over categories. Totally different chart here. There are two numbers, some number along the X or horizontal axis, um, out or in, plus or minus, and then second number along the vertical axis, up or down. So we go, in this case, out a certain distance, up a certain distance, and put a marker. OK, and XY scatter shows the relationship between two numbers. Now, we're going to see two examples, uh, two types of XY scatter, when to use the dots and when to use a line. All right, let's scroll down here. Here is a data set. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I'm going to hold my Control and roll the wheel on my mouse. That keyboard is great because it works everywhere. Excel, Word, websites. All right, so we have hours studied and test score. So we're wondering if there is a relationship between these two numbers. X always comes first, then you put your Y. The X is supposed to be the predictor variable. You'd, you'd think, since we've all studied and take te taken tests, the longer we study, hopefully, the higher the score. That means there will be a direct relationship. As this hour study goes up, the scores on our test will go up. Now, X has come first, and it's helpful to have labels at the top. Remember, the charts will name a series of numbers. All right, so I'm going to highlight. I'm going to go up to Insert. And under the Scatter, there's either the Scatter Dots or these lines. These lines are meaningless when you're actually collecting data. This is collected data. We did a test. Uh, we collected a random sample. You use the Scatter Dots when you have sample data. 
or population data for that matter. Lines are only when you have models like a fixed cost uh, um, net income model, which we'll look at next. All right, so I'm going to click on this. And instantly, it shows us a bunch of markers that indicate out a certain much. This is our study. This is test. Now, this is an example of where a chart really has to have horizontal and vertical um, labels on the axes. Now I'm going to click here, go up to the formula bar, type an equal sign, and link it to that cell right there. So we got this. Now font, if you control 1, this just maddens me. There's no font here. Why didn't they include it there? Now you could right click font. You know what, I'm just going to go up to the home because the font will work straight from this. I'm going to say sure 10. All right, I don't need this at all. I'm going to use my favorite key keyboard shortcut besides Control Z, delete. I'm going to get rid of these lines right here, delete. Now I want to go up to Layout, Axis Titles, and I'll go do the horizontal first. Title below. I'm immediately going to link this, not just the title, but the axis labels. Equal sign, and this is X. I love it. Look at that. Makes it a lot easier than having to type out. Now I'm going to go back up to Axis Titles. And now I want Rotated. Click click in the formula bar, equal sign, and click on my test score dash Y. All right, so there I have my labels. This video is an accounting seminar. It's probably, you guys aren't probably doing uh, linear algebra or regression or anything like that. But you can show the line. And you, you know if you, you know how to do that. It, it takes a while, and it's easy in Excel if you know all the functions. But watch this. You can right click these dots and go to Add Trend Line. And just like that, you say what type of regression type, linear. You can even come down here, show the equation, and R squared. I'm going to click Close. And just like that, it's right on top in the way. So I'm going to point to the edge. When I see that solid line, I'm going to click and drag. All right, so what does the XY scatter show? Probably shows a, um, or tries to show a relationship. It looks like there probably is some relationship. The more hours studied, the higher the score. If you get dots all over the place, that means there probably isn't a relationship between the two variables. Let's quickly look at another example because they don't always come out um, positive like this, meaning as x increases, y probably increases. It also can have the opposite, an inverse relationship. As x increases, y decreases. So as number of police in small towns increase, the crimes have some uh, relationship. Probably looks like they decrease. So let's highlight it and go to Insert. And I love charts because what do they do? They give you a quick visual. It looks like. As this one increases, oh, the Y decreases. All right, now let's go over to the next sheet, Break Even Analysis, and click. Here is an example where you might use the XY scatter, but you have a model that is uh, uniformly predicting. So here we can use our line. Now, I'm not going to go into how we calculate it, but here's our assumed units. We simply took our units here times our sales price. We calculated our total cost based on some assumptions down here. We have our fixed cost and our net income. Now, here's the cool thing about XY scatter. If you put your X first, all of the Ys, notice X units is going to determine sales, uh, total cost. It actually doesn't determine fixed cost, but we'll plot it against it anyway. X and 1, 2, 3 Ys, no way. It will, if you highlight and go to Insert, Scatter, and this is where we want to line. It will plot it perfectly. We've all seen this as in accounting. You're kidding me. Look at that. Just, in just clicking that one chart, and it looks just like all the textbooks or your models. Boom, there we go. Now we could add labels there. I'm not going to do that here. We have one last example to this for charts of this epic, epic video. I'm going to click on two chart types. Now here, we could go ahead and plot this as a column chart. We could see sales and expenses, and that would be fine. I'm going to, I can't Alt F1 because I've changed my default. So I'm going to go up to Insert, Column, and Column. I'm going to point to the edge here. I should have showed you this a long time ago. And click and drag to make it a little bit smaller. 
Now notice we have expenses. And we saw a mistake earlier in our one of our charting examples where we cha mistakenly changed one of the series to an incorrect chart type. But in this case, we want to change expenses to a line chart. And what does a line do? One number along the vertical, categories equidistance along the horizontal. It'll work fine. I'm going to right click, and it says Change Series Chart Type. You could certainly go up to Change Chart Type 2. It will assume that you want to do it just for that series. I'm going to click Line and click OK. And just like that, we've combined with a nice little uh, legend over here. And we could certainly uh, add a title if we wanted. Oh, that was an epic video. That's the longest video I've ever done, um, over two and a half hours. All right, we'll see you next video.